recognition of guests, the Honorable Premier. Uh, well, thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, welcome back to another afternoon of debate in the legislature for my colleagues and uh, those who are tuned in uh, online to uh, to watch today. I guess to to, to begin uh, uh, for the fans of Star Wars, may the uh, for, may the fourth be with you, and for those who were uh, elected uh, seven years ago, I believe in 2015, and there are a number in here. Uh, a happy anniversary. Um, I wanted to also, Mr. Speaker, uh, add my voice to those who have already raised that, uh, uh, that, that this week marks Mental Health Week. Uh, this year, uh, the focus being on, on empathy, uh, very appropriate given the last two years of how the pandemic has uh, impacted everyone uh, differently. And uh, I just want to say to the staff of CMHA, PEI, and to Shelley Mazika uh, and all they do uh, uh, for, for mental health and so many other partners, uh, thank you for that. I know they have a number of events planned across the island. And just just on behalf of all Islanders, thank them for the great work that they have done and will continue to do. Um, I'm always amazed, Mr. Speaker, at the global connections uh, a small province like Prince Edward Island is able to, uh, to achieve uh, in so many different fields. And it was nice to uh, hear of Phil McNevin from Stanley Bridge, uh, who got to work uh, uh, with uh, Dungeons and Dragons in a castle uh, uh, in Durham in the United Kingdom, Mr. Speaker. For those of us who grew up in the 80s, Dungeons and Dragons was, uh, was, was quite a phenomenon, and it's uh, impressive to hear that it, uh, it continues and that uh, uh, Phil got the chance to, to live one of his uh, childhood uh, memories and dreams uh, by participating in that, uh, in that event. Um, I also wanted to say, Mr. Speaker, that uh, as we begin to see some of our seasonal businesses open up with uh, the hint of spring that's been in the air the last couple of days and, and, and the summer that is to come. Uh, I, I was uh, uh, glad to see that the Tyne Valley Tea Room is going to open tomorrow and the Honourable uh, Member from Tig uh, or, sorry, sorry uh, I always forget the name because I can't see it, but yeah. Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, my apologies. Uh, uh, and it's uh, you know with with the with the uh, backwood burger and Dylan's and the, you know the, the Valley Pearl and all of those other places. Tyne Valley is a great spot, and of course the new uh, rink, Mr. Speaker, which everyone has been talking uh, tip to tip about what an impressive facility it is. I also, Mr. Speaker, just uh, on a final note that oftentimes in politics we think about how hard things are, are, are some of the some of the not so flashy sides of politics, but we all get the great privilege to be introduced to people from all walks of life. Uh, and uh, it's a great honor to be introduced to, and to be welcomed into the world of, of some people, uh, uh, some special people. And one of those opportunities came for me on Wednesday when I had the, uh, the great pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Emerson Cornish, a uh, seven-year-old uh, from Summerside, to his mom, Tara, and his grandmother, uh, Diana Arsenault. Uh, uh, they come in to uh, have me sign a, a, a designation for the 5P minus syndrome, Mr. Speaker, and the awareness uh, programs that they're trying to roll out to make more people aware of that uh, disease, which is a, a chromosomal de de chromosome deletion disorder, which causes uh, challenges. And uh, Emerson is one of two in Prince Edward Island who've been diagnosed with this kind of rare uh, genetic disorder, and uh, it was just so. Uh, heartwarming to learn a little bit more about 5P minus and, and uh, the challenges that uh, families and individuals face with that. But it was also so uplifting to me to sit across from, from Emerson. He had a wonderful bow tie on, he had beautiful big blue eyes, and he was smiling at me and holding my hand. And it was, a, it was one of those rare moments that you get in this business where uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and a great honor. So just to, to Emerson, to Tara, to Diana, and, and all those uh, dealing with 5P minus, uh, Thank you very much for sharing that with me, and we'll continue to try to do everything we can to help those in need. So thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I'd, I'd like to welcome a couple of friends to the gallery today. Bethany, Bethany Colick at McNabb, of course, who's a regular visitor here. Lovely to see you, Bethany. And in the front row, Judith Bayliss. Judith is the mother of the member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Very proud mother, I'm, I have no doubt, and I have no doubt about that. And I know what an inspiration she has been to the member from Charlottetown Belvedere over the years, and actually to many others as well for your work, your lifelong work in the community and helping those who are less privileged than ourselves. So thank you for the work you've done, Judith, and it's lovely to see you here today. As the Premier mentioned, this is the seven-year anniversary of many members of this House getting elected, and I, I am one of those people. And that was a very special night. 
I remember it well and will carry it, no doubt, for the rest of my life. But I want to particularly mention somebody who was instrumental. I mean, there were hundreds of people, of course, behind all of us ending up in our seats in this House. But one person in particular who guided me through that time, who was my campaign manager, who was my first and solitary staff member here when I took up my position as MLA for District 17, and who continues to be a true and a wonderful companion in my political life and in life writ large, um, Patrick Levesque. Um, uh, I want to thank Pat for the companionship he's offered me, for the counsel he's offered me, the political wisdom he has offered me. I love you, Pat. Thank you. Um, and this week, the Women's Institute Roadside Cleanup uh, is scheduled to happen. Now, those of us who live in rural districts have probably already seen a number of folks out on the side of the roads picking, uh, picking garbage up. And uh, there was one particularly miserable morning when I was driving. Uh, I'm not sure I was coming here where I was going, but it was one of those cold, rainy mornings that we had last week. And I, I saw several people out with clear bags picking up garbage at the side of the road. And uh, this is the 50th year that the WI has done this on Prince Edward Island. And it's a real unfortunate, it's unfortunate, it's necessary. But I have deep gratitude for those that do that. So thank you to the WI and everybody who comes forward. And that, that event is on Saturday the 14th. You can pick up bags at Access PEI. You can pick them up at libraries. Or you can just show up with your own clear bags and help keep this island as beautiful as it is. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Jonathan, leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always a pleasure to rise, the legislature, and welcome everyone. Welcome folks in the gallery and everyone watching back home in Evangeline Muskush. Mr. Speaker, May is Muscular Cirrhosis Awareness Month in Canada. In this, in this country, we have one of the highest rates of MS in the world, and many Islanders have experienced this illness and its impacts firsthand. It is important that their challenges be recognized and that research into the disease continue so that the vision of the MS Society of Canada can be realized, which is a world, which is a world without MS. And Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to recognize today is International Firefighters Day, and I want to thank our firefighters, active and retired, for their commitment to keeping the citizens of Prince Edward Island safe. We also, and also reflect on those who have served in the past and pay respect to those who made the ultimate sacrifice while serving in the line of duty. Today and every day, we must honor firefighters and their selfless sacrifices to the island communities they serve. Thank you to all our firefighters, including the volunteer force, for your ongoing courage, sacrifice, and bravery in keeping us all safe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, it's not often I get to rise in the house and say, hi, Mum. <laughs> but <laughs> but it is, it is, um, it's lovely to see you here today and also my friend Bethany Colicott mcnab who is the president of the District 11 EDA and has been working very hard um, to get ready for policy motions this weekend. Um, also happening this weekend, Mr. Speaker, it's Farmer's Day at the Charlottetown Farmer's Market. Um, and there'll be music, door prizes, seed sales, but it's also a chance to thank our local farmers in the heart of the city and show the support for the farmer's market, which is really, you know, a remarkable space and something that we all love and appreciate. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Mermaid Stratford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Hi to everybody watching at home in Mermaid Stratford and to all my colleagues today. Um, it's, ex it's an exciting day. Not only is the, the first feed of lobsters going to be coming in, but the Stratford and area lions will be turning on their briny pots and they'll be boiling up some lobsters for everybody to enjoy today as well. And Mr. Speaker, um, all of the profits that they make off their lobster campaign go right back into the community in, in the form of donations. And they sell out quick, so I suggest everybody get into the lineups. So just to share the, the time that they're open, they're cooking today, so they'll be open from 1 o'clock until sellout today, and then Thursday from 1 to 5.30, 10, 10 to 5.30 on Friday, and 10 o'clock until sellout on Saturday. Don't wait until Saturday, because I'm telling you, they sell out quick. Anyway, thanks to all the Stratford Area Alliance for all their hard work, and uh, happy lobster campaign time. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Agriculture, Land, uh, Justice, Public Safety, and Attorney General. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to say hi to everyone in district, beautiful District 8, Stano Marshfield. Tomorrow, May 5th, is World Pulmonary Hypertension Day, recognized annual since 2012, Mr. Speaker. 
This day focuses on the importance of improving quality of life and the life expectancy of those with it. Pulmonary hypertension can strike people at all ages, all backgrounds, and all genders. I want to recognize those living with PH and create a public awareness about the disease. Lastly, I would like to recognize Jennifer Bryson, a constituent of District 8, who is a proud advocate locally, nationally, and globally for pulmonary hypertension awareness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and say hello to everyone watching from home. Hello, Judith. Hello, Bethany. Um, and to all of my colleagues here in the legislature. So it is no mo May. Uh, we are well into it now, and it's just uh, an opportunity for us all to resist getting out our lawnmowers and allow the grass and dandelions and clover to grow so that the pollinators can do their work. Uh, and I want to thank Claire Gallant for bringing this to my attention. Um, it's a pleasure to bring it forward here, and, and I hope we see lots of full-grown uh, lawns uh, this month. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Brighton. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm always impressed when islanders take action themselves instead of waiting for the government to do it. I read this morning with pleasure that Jim Wormsley is planning a mini home community on his land in Bedford Station, a project that will no doubt stretch the flexibility or lack of same of our Minister of Agriculture. I hope the Minister will see a way of allowing such an experimental community. So carry on, Mr. Wormsley. We desperately need new housing initiatives. Thank you. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, as uh, the Premier had alluded to, uh, this is uh, Mental Health Week. So today I want to recognize Mental Health Week that is being held from May 2nd to May 8th. This year's CMHA Mental Health Week is all about empathy. Mr. Speaker, when times are tough, there are many ways for Islanders to find the right support. They can call the Mental Health and Addictions Access Line, 1833. 5536983 or email the mental health and addictions patient navigator MHA patient navigator at ihis.org thank you mr speaker i miss anyone if not member statements the honorable member from time valley sherbrooke and the opposition whip Funded through the Department of Justice Canada, the SHIFT project through the PEI Human Rights Commission has been doing incredible work on PEI to identify and address workplace sexual harassment. Through this project, Islanders had the opportunity to complete a survey on workplace sexual harassment. Of the, over, of the 1,621 responses, over 1,000 people had directly experienced sexual harassment at some point in their career and many more than once. The majority of those who had experienced harassment were women. Though many reported these incidents to a manager or employer, approximately 33% had not reported at all. However, even in cases where those who reported were satisfied with the outcome, there were still far-reaching social and emotional impacts for those who had been harassed. In fact, 97% of those who had reported experiencing sexual harassment were negatively impacted by the experience in some or multiple ways. Some of these impacts have direct negative consequences for our businesses and the economy, such as difficulty focusing or lost productivity, workers needing to take time off work or leaves of absence, or even leaving a job or the labor market altogether. But most importantly, there are also harmful and often lasting effects on the mental health and well-being of Islanders and their families, such as low self-esteem, loss of dignity, stress, anxiety, depression, and physical health impacts such as nausea, headaches, and sleeping problems. Sexual harassment is not only a justice issue, but a workforce, for economy, and social issue. If we are striving to make PEI workplaces safe and supportive, spaces for all workers, we must identify, challenge, and change the culture that allows sexual harassment to persist within too many of our island workspaces. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Mer Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, next week is National Nurses Week. The best way for this government to show island nurses they are appreciated is to start listening to them. 
Mr. Speaker, can you imagine not consulting the nurses on the health care budget? In response to the budget of the 2022-2023 operating budget, the PEI Nurses Union issued a statement expressing disappointment that they were not consulted. This government focused on retention, or sorry, on recruitment in this budget. If the nurses union had been consulted, they would have emphasized the importance of retention. That's what they need to be focused on. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues in the official opposition recognize how important nurses are, and we've been listening and we've been asking for retention initiatives which have fallen on deaf ears. Initiatives such as child care spaces located close to health care facilities with flexible hours, COVID bonuses to say thank you instead of empty platitudes, exit surveys for all existing R or, uh, sorry, all exiting RNs to shed light on the truth as to why government has been failing the frontline health care workers. Um, offer overtime shifts to island nurses before privately hired travel nurses who have no commitment to Prince Edward Island health care system. Implement the Garth Waite rep um, report recommendations. Improve safety because no nurse should have to tolerate violent, violence in their workplace. <coughs> you say you listen to experts. And guess what? Nurses are experts. My colleagues on this side of the house recognize that. But do you? You didn't consult with them in the operational budget or on the travel nurse proposal, or the mental, mobile mental health units, or the pucks closing. And I could go on and on, but that would just get embarrassing for this government. They say the good ideas are good ideas, regardless of who the ideas are coming from, so prove it. This National Nurses Week, put your money where your mouth is and prove it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> the shocking but not surprising news broke late on Monday night. The U.S. Supreme Court has drafted an opinion to reverse the 50-year-old legislation known as Roe v. Wade that enshrined the right to safe and legal abortion services for U.S. women. But that's the U.S. Why should we care here in Canada? In Canada, abortion is legal at all stages of pregnancy, regardless of reason, and is publicly funded as a medical procedure under the combined effects of the Federal Canada Health Act and provincial health care systems. Abortion is legal the same way that heart surgery is legal. Medical procedures you can either get or not get based on access and capacity. The immediate worry in Canada is the real threat to choice through austerity and barriers to access. Absence of services is the status quo way of oppressing and suppressing people from time immemorial, whether it's through the ability to vote, to marry, inequity in health care or equal pay. You must have access to a local hospital that includes abortions in health care services, and many Canadians don't, especially rural and remotely, remote or those in low income. That was the case here in PEI, Mr. Speaker, for 35 years, where there was no access in the province, and it wasn't discussed in this house, it wasn't included in health care planning, it was out of sight, but it was never out of mind for women in PEI. That oppression through denial of access to service changed only through the coordinated efforts over years by dedicated activists who eventually threatened the provincial government with legal action, which forced the province to provide full and unrestricted access to publicly funded medical services on the island beginning in 2017. That was only five years ago. There is also now a vocal and well-organized anti-choice movement in Canada and MPs and provincial legislators across the country who are clear about their intent to reopen the abortion debate and remove a woman's right to choose in this country. That does not mean that there is a current crisis in Canada, Mr. Speaker, but we do not have the option of complacency. Women's rights activists around the world and here in PEI continue the fight for full-fledged equality because we know firsthand how fragile those hard-won rights are. From voting rights to fair treatment in the workplace, access to education and the pursuit of reproductive and sexual freedom. The patriarchy disproportionately affects racialized and indigenous women. If you belong to a group that has never had to go to court to prove you deserve the human rights or bodily autonomy afforded to others, then you have a privilege that islanders who identify as women, LBGTQIA or BIPOC have never experienced. History matters, our voices matter, the struggle is real and it continues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? For our first question, I'll call on the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. 
The Minister of Fisheries and Communities has been stubbornly refusing to answer questions on the mismanagement of Charlottetown City Council, but you know what? Islanders deserve answers, so we're going to keep trying. Yeah. Yesterday, the Minister said during question period, and I quote, there appears to be a lack, a lot of conflict, I will say, within the City Council, which is a lack of respect and cooperation in following what is required. This is not what islanders expect of our councillors across this island." End quote. To the Minister of Fisheries and Communities, if we're in a situation beyond which council can handle, which it certainly sounds like you think they are, if the province won't step in, which they definitely won't, yeah. what recourse is there for the citizens of this province of Charlottetown and the staff of City Hall? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We must remember that we have duly elected individuals by the City of Charlottetown who have been trusted to follow the bylaws and the rules and regulations of the City under the MGA. I don't understand why the opposition does not trust the Mayor and Council who have been elected to handle HR matters and operations within the city of Charlottetown. Donald Leader of the official opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I mean, that's a really interesting and often heard answer in the last few days. But a couple of years ago, uh, in my own area, the town of Crapo, the council there unraveled. And the minister stepped in very quickly and very decisively to install uh, an interim CAO and to ensure that that municipality was being governed appropriately and positively from there on. To the same minister, why are you telling us that you won't interfere with matters in one place, but you feel perfectly fine being extremely proactive and interventionary somewhere else? I would invite the Honourable Leader of the Opposition to actually divulge into the facts and compare the two situations. In the town of Crapo, they had gone from seven councillors down to three. And under the MGA, you cannot operate the municipality with only three councillors. In the city of Charlottetown, we have a matter between an employer and an employee which involves human resource matters. Why will not this honourable member allow the council that was trusted to deal with matters within the city deal with the matters? Opposition. Mr. Speaker, to answer that question, I'm going to go back to the first one I asked, where I quoted the minister, where you say there's a lack of respect and a lack of following what is required, no, that the islanders expect more of their councillors. That's why, minister. The minister frequently starts his often disjointed and contradictory responses to questions by saying he's either amused or confused or disappointed or sad with the questioner. Well, you know what? I often feel all of those sentiments simultaneously when I listen to the minister tie himself in knots over this issue. First, there was no investigation at all. Then it's an investigative report. Then it's a legal opinion on something totally different. It has been shared. It hasn't been shared. The minister won't interfere. He shows he's very willing to do that elsewhere. To the premier, are you satisfied with how your minister has handled this alarming situation in Charlottetown? And is this an example of the openness and transparency that you have promised Islanders? The Honourable Premier. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I think since the day we've taken up occupancy in these chairs, we've tried to run uh, a government that is respectful, Mr. Speaker, that is understanding of democracy, and that is open to all of those who participate in it. I think what the minister is continually trying to say is, we have a, a situation in the city of Charlottetown where there are some challenges, but there are elected people who are elected by the citizens of the city who have a responsibility first uh, to deal with that, Mr. Speaker, and that is exactly what their job is to do. At some point, if seven councillors re resign, Mr. Speaker, under the MGA, the minister would have the authority to come in to help, Mr. Speaker, but we certainly don't want to run a government that is in uh, making decisions and say, I'm sorry, the city of Summerside, we don't like what you did, we're going to interfere. That's not our job, Mr. Speaker. Our job is to observe. Our job is to observe, Mr. Speaker. Let them do the work they're supposed to do, Mr. Speaker, and that's what he's doing. The minister's doing a wonderful job, Mr. Speaker. Some 
Come aside, South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, in an interview, the Minister of Fisheries and Communities revealed that the so-called investigation was actually an opinion from a lawyer about a separate human resources matter, not the financial irregularities and governance issues that were first raised. First, he said it was not shared with the city. Then, 20 seconds later, that the results were provided to the city. But then he couldn't say who received it. I find it very telling and truly an affront to our governance that the minister answers this house differently than he answers reporters. Mm -hmm. Question to the minister. Why does your story change every time you speak about this investigation? Honorable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. The only thing that's changed in this house is now we have a flip-flop from the honorable member asking the question now to what the honorable leader of the opposition said a week ago and other times previous. What? That's the flip-flop. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I will further state, I will further state, how come we are not hearing from the MLAs that actually live within the city of Charlottetown? They're not saying a word. We had the Honourable Leader of the Opposition that two weeks ago says he supports the elected officials within the city of Charlottetown. Now we have the Leader of the Opposition joining the other Honourable Member going against the elected officials within the City of Charlottetown. Summerside, South Drive. Minister, it's your responsibility to uh, look into a uh, review or an investigation any time that you see fit. And if you don't see fit to do that in this situation, I, uh, you're a lost cause, Minister. The Minister has told CBC that he needs to give the City more time to work out its human resource issues. By his own admission, the Minister has been aware of issues since 2019. There's been plenty of time. Now with a severance package being negotiated for the CAO at the centre of the issue, time is one thing we can't afford to waste. The taxpayers of Charlottetown deserve the Minister's full attention to the matter. For him to use his, to quote himself, quite a lot of power to act, to act. <laughs> Question to the Minister, will you immediately investigate the financial irregularities and governance issues, or are you going to sit back until the CAO of Charlottetown has sailed into the sunset with a six-figure golden handshake? The Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You know, it totally amazes me. We have a party over here, an opposition, that says they're there for people's rights and there for the way things are run in a de dem democratic society, and they talk about different types of voting, but yet they want to exercise, they want to have somebody else exercise the authority and go in and shut down a council. Shut down a council that's been duly elected. I think, and I would advise Islanders to take note of where this party is going when it comes to democracy across Prince Edward Island. Charlottetown, Belvedere. It's pretty clear that this government's proposed cost of living relief program was announced back in March without figuring out the details. And Islanders are paying that price, Mr. Speaker. We've heard over and over that the delay is with the CRA. Yet we know that this government is capable of getting programs up and running quickly. We saw you do it more than once at the beginning of the pandemic. To the Minister of Finance, I understand why you want to deliver this assistance through the CRA, but why haven't you prioritized another route to get immediate relief to Islanders in the meantime? Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Speaker, and Honourable Member, we are working on that. We, we, we've, we've discussed this over and over again. We have a possibility of 90, upwards of 90,000 Islanders who receive this payment. The provincial government does not have the mechanism in place to issue those payments in a timely fashion. It would take much longer than it would to partner with uh, CRA. So we are working with CRA and Islanders will receive that payment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over there. Mr. Speaker, you know what I'm hearing over and over? How frustrated Islanders are with this government. We now know that the so-called emergency relief won't make its way into Islanders' pockets until at least July. And that delay is simply not acceptable, given that the relief was announced. That relief was announced eight weeks ago with great fanfare. Some funds have gone to the food bank and the home heating oil program, but most Islanders, 90,000 Islanders, are still waiting. 
A question to the Minister of Finance. We were quick to hand out gift cards to tourists last year. What's preventing this government from providing gift cards to islanders as an interim measure while you coordinate with the CRA? Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. Absolutely nothing is, is preventing us from doing that. We're working on other ways we can help Islanders as we speak, and we will deliver a number of programs. But I might also point out, as I did earlier, that we have implemented a number of programs already. We're freezing fees, we're stabilizing to prevent That's increase in waste fees, yep. extra money for NGOs, Tooney Transit, free heat pumps, expanded seniors independence program, expanded Salvation Army home heating program, extended funding for food banks, one-time payment to social assistance, extra money to student unions, Increased basic personal amount, increased income tax bracket, and lower costs for child care. Wow. Those are all for Islanders. I don't remember. Don't go over there. I love that you have to have that as a saver on your phone so that you can read it out on a regular basis. I think I could get the screensaver. I could get the same screensaver and save us all the trouble. The problem is, Minister, that at this point, Islanders are expecting what you promised. You promised them $150, and honestly, at this point, with the rate of inflation, I don't even know if $150 to $50 is going to help. Don't you think it would be more effective to provide Islanders with some recurring payments, like a quarterly rebate, for example? Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. You talk one way about how we need to be fiscally responsible and you talk the other way about how we need to give Islanders everything we possibly can. We are working to ensure Islanders are we're there for Islanders. We'll continue to do that. We cannot make everyone whole, but we will do what we can for Islanders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, this quick government is pretty quick to roll out $20 million with nothing in the budget, and don't worry about it. We'll figure it out with our general government contingency fund. So I don't know if that's a completely fiscally responsible minister. I'm waiting for the supplementary warrant. You need to get your own fiscal house in order before you lecture anybody else. It's pretty clear that this was announced as a temporary measure to a short-term emergency, but we know now that the rising cost of living is not temporary, and more islanders are going to need help. Your imaginary emergency funds are not going to be enough. Question to the minister. All we've seen is Band-Aid solutions, a list, and the advice to tighten your belts. What are you actually doing to help islanders with the rising cost of living? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm a member. I do have it on my phone because I cannot remember all of those items to list off, but I will do it again for Islanders so they know we are doing for them what we possibly can. We are freezing payments, freezing fees, subsidizing to prevent increase in waste fees, extra money for NGOs, Tooney Transit, free heat pumps, expanded seniors independence program, expanded Salvation Army home heating program, extra fooding, funding for food banks, one-time payment of social assistance, extra money for student unions, increased basic personal amount, increased low-income tax bracket, and lowered the cost of child care. Those are all for Islanders, Honourable Member. Mermaid Strafford. Mr. Speaker, this government is using a provincial health plan from 2011. Shame. On March 11th, the minister said a draft is ready for consultation. Question to the Minister of Health. It's now May 4th. Has consultation started, and if so, who has been consulted? The Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And yes, I'm extremely proud of the work that our staff, our hardworking staff, my hardworking staff, are doing in this as we move forward. Uh, the strategic plan that the Honourable Member has referenced, yes, it has formed the basis of what we are doing at this point. But yes, we have to uh, look forward. We have to consult with Islanders. But again, Mr. Speaker, I applaud the work that those in my department are doing as we move forward on this. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'm not talking about your strategic plan. I'm talking about the provincial health plan. I certainly hope the Minister of Health and Wellness knows the difference. Last week, when asked about hiring travel nurses, the Minister said he talked to the PEI Nurses Union, which he hadn't. Question to the Minister of Health. Will the Nurses Union be consulted on your provincial health plan? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I don't know where the Honourable Member is getting her information because I had spoke. I had spoke the afternoon before. Absolutely, I had. Mr. Speaker, then subsequent to that, I had a meeting on Friday afternoon with the Nurses' Union. Mr. Speaker, 
This morning, I met with the PEI Nurses Union at their AGM up in the great city of Summerside. I got feedback, and we're always getting feedback from our frontline staff, whether it's nurses, whether it's RCWs, whether it's LPNs. And Mr. Speaker, on this side of the house, I will continue to do that. Thank you. Nurses Union even commented that you hadn't spoken to them when you spoke in this house, Minister. There are 285 eligible nurses, sorry, registered nurses eligible to retire in the next year. That is in top, on top of the staggering vacancy rate. There are ways to retain nurses, including valuing them so that they would might want to extend their careers. Question to the minister, will you offer retention bonuses to nurses to stabilize the human resource issues you're faced with? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and at least that there is one thing that uh, the Honourable Member and I are on the same side of the page on, and that is with regard to the importance of retention. Yes, recruitment is absolutely paramount, but when we recruit, if we can't retain, yes, we, uh, we have major challenges. Mr. Speaker, I've had those conversations, and again, contrary to what uh, the Honourable Member would lead Islanders to believe I have had those conversations and I will continue to have them and I will continue to work with our partners. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, but your budget says differently. Mr. Speaker, nurses in this province have held the health care system together through blood, sweat and tears, especially over the last two years. This government has given them little more than platitudes and no, and no action. This is causing turnover within units and facilities. 15 out of 20 staff at the Provincial Addiction Treatment Facility has left in the last year. The vacancy rate at one of the Prince County Hospital units has gone from 27% vacancy rate to 42% vacancy rate in one year, and 103 long-term care beds remain empty. Minister, are these numbers indicators of a health care system that is doing well? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And are those numbers indica indicative of a health care system that is doing well? I would answer that in two ways. That there's always uh, opportunity. We have to always strive to improve the health care delivery to Islanders. Mr. Speaker, at the same time, we also have to have programs in place that, that recruit health care workers into the workplace. Mr. Speaker, the Honourable Member mentions with regard to long-term care beds. Mr. Speaker, one of the reasons that we had put in place a very short time ago uh, free tuition for our RCWs is to address that exact need. And we will continue to put programs in place to address the needs of Islanders. Thank you. Yesterday at the chamber meeting, the Premier told business leaders that our health care system was improving because on that side of the House, they have a plan. I'm wondering if the, if the Premier shared his plan with the Minister of Health and Wellness because he's working off a 10-year-old health care plan for Prince Edward Island. And he can't seem to finish any strategy or frameworks. The, the Premier is quite the storyteller once he gets on a roll. So to the Premier, what key performance indicators are you using to determine progress in the health care system? And will you table the actual information to back up your claim? The Honourable Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'll share the story of what took place yesterday. Uh, at the risk of uh, offending everyone on that side of the house for being a storyteller, Mr. Speaker, but I'll do it anyway. I was asked a question about what we have, how we have approached differently health care services and the provision in this province, and I said that when we came into this uh, job, we knew there were challenges in here and that we would get away from the knee-jerk political decisions that have taken place for far too long in this province that just take one fire from one place and move it to another to allow the professionals at Health PEI to lead the charge, to, to put the plan in place. We are putting that plan in place, Mr. Speaker. I've asked both the ministers who have had the privilege to serve in the job not to interfere like they did before, Mr. Speaker. They're going to absorb, to have to absorb some body blows from people in the legislature, and they have done that, Mr. Speaker. But our goal is, I'm sorry for the story, to make this better in Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. And the way to do that is to take the silly politics out of it and let the professionals do their work, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Charlottetown 
Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It was not until 2017 that women in this province won full rights over their health. After a long fought fought battle and inaction from government after government, the women of this province challenged government in court and won the right to abortion services. This is not something that women in this province take for granted as we watch women all over the world continue to fight for their own rights. With the recent news of the potential overturn of Roe versus Wade in the U.S., women are concerned. Question to the minister responsible for the status of women. Can you commit here today to island women that under your watch, access to abortion services will be protected? Minister responsible for this? Yes, Says a winner. Charlottetown, West Royalty. Last Friday, there was a serious incident at the Community Outreach Center when a client was assaulted by another client inside the center. The Community Outreach Center is an avenue for homeless islanders and people reaching out for assistance. Along with staff and the surrounding community, everyone expects a safe environment. Time will tell when the criminal investigation is before the courts and is made public what exactly happened. But at this point, a person has been charged with serious charges. Question to the Minister of Public Safety. What steps is your department taking to ensure the public safety at and around this government facility? The Honorable Minister of Justice, Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my staff has, have talked to the city police, Mr. Speaker, who uh, are responsible for the outreach facility, Mr. Speaker, and we're having ongoing cons cons uh, discussions about the safety and well-being of all islanders, Mr. Speaker, and uh, they have a dedicated resource, uh, Mr. Speaker, that uh, for that community uh, outreach center, Mr. Speaker, and they uh, will continue to work with the city police to make sure the safety and well-being of everyone. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, West Royalty. Well, an abundance and an, an a incredible amount of repetitive and frequent calls uh, for police services and the Charlottetown City Police respond to issues at that location. And it ties up services and resources to respond to other emergencies and impedes the overall public safety in the area. Question to the Minister of Public Safety. Will you advise the Department of Social Development and Housing to implement on-site security personnel during hours of operation at the Air Reach Center in an attempt to mitigate further incidents and not to continually tie up police and take care of the safety of, of individuals using the facility. The Honorable Minister of Justice and Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I cannot speak for the Minister of Social Development and Housing, Mr. Speaker, but I will continue to work with the Minister and continue to work with uh, Chief Mc uh, of the city police, Mr. Speaker, to ensure the safety of, and the resources are put in place, Mr. Speaker. But the municipality force is, is uh, they, they operate uh, separate from government, Mr. Speaker, but we'll continue to work with them. And I'm happy with the up, upstream approach that it, we are taking with this outreach center, Mr. Speaker. And I think it's, uh, there's going to be some challenges and bumps in the road, Mr. Speaker, but uh, the, the, the government here is working for uh, all islanders and ensure the safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, West Royalty. I'm happy with the services. I'm just not happy with the safety right now. And I'm asking you, and you're talking about punting it off, we need you to step up as a minister and make sure there's security there and work with you, work with you both together. The Department of Social Development and Housing has said there's a review of policies and procedures of the Every Center, which is a new contract, and they're in a time of transition. Question to the Minister of uh, Justice and Public Safety. There's been numerous public concerns regarding the safety of the Every Center and the safety of those who live in the surrounding community. Has your department been invited to participate in the review of services, and what suggestions will you bring to the table as the Minister of Justice and Public Safety? Justice and Public Safety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I said earlier in a, one of my answers, Mr. Speaker, the, the city police have a de dedicated resource, uh, Mr. Speaker. They are the ones talking with the adventure group, Mr. Speaker. They are working with the uh, Department of uh, Social Housing Development, Mr. Speaker. They are coming up with a plan, and I'm, a, I'm a proud of the, the approach. And like I said, there's going to be bumps in the road, but you can ensure that our department will work for the safety and well-being of all islanders, including islanders that uh, are go to the outreach center, Mr. Speaker. You can count on that. Thank you. King Nurse Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday was setting day. It's an exciting day all, with all those who are involved in the island's lobster fishing industry. Unfortunately, this day was less exciting for those involved in the bait fishing industry, as their season was abruptly cancelled a month ago. 
Three weeks ago, the Minister of Fisheries and Communities stated his department would stand behind the bait fishers and support them during this time. Their boats are tied up, but their payments still need to be made. Question to the Minister of Fisheries. What specifically have you done to support these bait fishers who rely on this industry for their livelihood? Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's a really good, great question uh, by the Honourable Member. Um, I know that we have talked with the, in the department about is there an opportunity for uh, fishers to bring their loans over from uh, other banks or financial institutions, institutions over to possibly to finance PEI. So we've been talking about some different scenarios within the department on that. But I've also had further talks with uh, the local MPs, uh, Bobby Morrissey there about a week ago and also the federal minister's office uh, the week before about the impact this is having. So as all I can tell the honourable members are I'm having conversations I can feel for these individuals. Uh, uh, they, you know, they, they've gone out and they've invested in, a, in an industry and they need to have a, an income in that to support that. So uh, we are working on it and hopefully we'll be able to come to some a resolution uh, between a multiple group of partners. Tignish Palmer Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So there needs to be more of a sense of urgency on this issue. Those bait fishers have payments to make. Um, so we know that it's, it's both federal and, 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 well, and provincial um, resp are responsible for this industry. They are here in Prince Rodon. So you talked about advocating to the MPs, to the federal government, to the federal minister. What have you advocated for, and was there a specific timeline and ask from them? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Communities. Uh, you, the, you know, the Honourable Member is right on. This is urgent, because uh, these people do have uh, loan payments to make, and they also have employees they have to employ, and those people are also being affected. So. You know, I'm having the conversations as quick as I can with the, with the departments involved. And also, we'll be hopefully putting something before another department within the government as soon as possible to see if we can add some kind of assistance to them. Thank you. Tignish Pomero. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'll uh, continue to ask you even when the House closes, because that's very, very important to those people. So, Minister, you also continue to say how you're going to be there for the industry. But until we see tangible action, it's all just words. So I will hold your feet to the fire. So what alternative species of fish, not products, alternative species of fish or markets has your department identified for the, for the fishers who are affected by the cancellation of the bait industry? Mm, good. Yeah, I'm, uh Minister of Communities and Fisheries. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have reached out to, uh, to other countries, and I'm actually have, will be having talks uh, with possibly some other suppliers within the next probably seven days, ten days, uh, on how we can access more bait coming into this country. And uh, this will be on an Atlantic Canada initiative, basically, that we're leading um, to have them conversations to make sure that we can get uh, new, possibly new supplies in bait. But I'm also there. Uh, you know, we want to support bait masters also has come up with an alternative source and looking at other innovative ways that we can help make sure that our fishers have bait that they require going into this season coming forward or this season right now in the fall and also next year and for the future. Thank you. Donald, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's been mentioned this week is Mental Health Week. Gambling addiction is an addiction not talked about as frequently, but can be one of the most difficult addictions to overcome and have the most rapid devastating effects on an individual and their loved ones. And yet, I remind everyone, this government and Atlantic Lottery Corporation saw an opportunity during the height of the pandemic and with no responsible gaming strategy to bring in online gaming for PEI. Question to the Minister of Finance. Where is the responsible gaming strategy and why have you irresponsibly advanced online gaming on PEI without it? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. And we are still working on the responsible gaming strategy. It is almost complete. I will uh, update the House whenever I have the date for that. And uh, as far as uh, starting any on online gaming, we are not doing that, Honourable Member. We said we would review it. We are looking at uh, what the, the result of the responsible gaming strategy is going to be, and we'll move from there. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We never know just how many negative impacts the actions and inexcusably poor timing of this government introducing online gaming has had on Islanders who struggle with, game, with gambling addictions. As the Minister said, they're not doing it, but we wonder what else are they doing. While it's not nearly yeah. close to the true picture of the issue, uh -huh. having data collected on these who self-exclude from online gaming would be of some benefit. Questions of the Minister. Does Atlantic Lottery collect self-exclusions? collect data on self-exclusions 
If so, many individuals have self-excluded via the online platform since the beginning of the pandemic. The Honorable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And Honorable Member, I, I, I don't have the figures in front of me as to who would uh, exclude, self-exclude, but there are a number of mechanisms through Atlantic Lottery online that you can. You can set your limits. Uh, you can't change that limit for within 24 hours, is my understanding. Uh, you, you have to prove who you are online, which is not the way it is with, with other uh, online uh, illegal gambling uh, sites. There are a number of strategies there. Uh, there's pop-ups to, to tell you, you know, that maybe you should take a break. There are a number of ways that um, ALC is working to ensure that their clients are doing it in a healthy way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Cornwall Metabank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, photo radar is a subject that generates some discussion. And speaking with many of my constituents, I've, got, I've been surprised by the number of questions I've had around photo radar, how it will work now that the legislate, legislative framework is now in place. Question to the Minister of Transportation. Will there be any threshold or allowance set for enforcement so that if you're detected going just above the posted limit, will there be some administrative discretion? The Honorable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, again, as Minister of Transportation Infrastructure, I'm very proud that we did get this legislation uh, passed in this House. Um, and, uh, Mr. Speaker, as I've previously alluded to, uh, the file is currently with Justice and Public Safety to uh, determine exactly how the fines uh, will be levied. Uh, and uh, there would be uh, revenue sharing as well between uh, various municipalities who have their own police forces. Uh, so, Mr. Speaker, as we move forward, uh, my department will be working cl very closely with uh, Justice and Public Safety to uh, ascertain exactly uh, the mechanisms in place to uh, look at uh, uh, demerit points and, and the level of fines. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Cornwall Metabank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, demerit points because that is another question that I've been receiving from uh, some of my constituents. I think I have, we have some significant speeding areas in, in my district. So my question to the Minister of Transportation, what kind of impact will there be on a person's demerit points for a photo radar violation? John Bo, Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, one of the uh, one of the shortcomings of, of this technology is it will take a picture of the license plate on the vehicle and it'll uh, have it re record it with speed, but it won't actually uh, identify who the driver of that vehicle was. So, it could be uh, it could be uh, my my son, or or someone else that I've lent that vehicle to, Mr. Speaker. So. Uh, we're doing jurisdictional scans right now across the country to see what other jurisdictions do with regards to demerit points. Uh, and uh, as we get that research uh, uh, together, we'll best determine how to proceed uh, on the demerit points. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Cornwall Metabanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the other main question that I receive is really about when will this photo radar come into force? Um, so question to the minister, when can Islanders expect to see photo radar being deployed in island roads and what remaining hurdles exist to see it becoming operational? Honorable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So Mr. Speaker, again, uh, this was uh, not only brought forward uh, from my departments and officials of my department, but it was also a request by the uh, Federation of Municip Municipalities here on PEI. And, and we're working with the municipalities as well to to uh, fast track this. So uh, as soon as we can get the, the work that's required uh, to be completed within the Department of Justice and Public Safety and the municipalities, uh, I look forward to having this launched. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If we really believe that housing is a human right, that means making sure that Islanders can access the housing they need at, reasonab at a reasonable cost. It's pretty clear that PEI's real estate market is grossly overpriced compared to what Islanders can pay for what they need. I just read this morning that we are close to having the highest prices in the country in urban areas. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Do you think current real estate prices on PEI are reasonable? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And there, there's no doubt, uh, it's, it's well known that uh, the prices of real estate on PEI have increased dramatically over the last uh, number of years, and uh, they, the, really the, the wages of Islanders in many cases has, uh, has not kept pace, Mr. Speaker. And so when you look at whether prices are reasonable, you have to look at the ability of Islanders to find the housing they need. Um, of course, the, the right to, uh, 
to housing is, is, is one in which there should be housing available, and uh, that's what we, we strive to address, and uh, we're going to continue to do that. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government opposes tighter regulation on housing. Instead, they prefer to treat it as a commodity to be left to the free market, an investment opportunity to generate profit. That decision means first-time home buyers and young growing families needing to upsize to a larger home are having to compete with real estate investors with much deeper pockets. Absolutely. Question to the minister, how do you expect first-time home buyers and growing, young growing families to compete with investors? Well, uh, well thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, um, there's, there's a, a lot of variables involved in what the, the member's talking about, and uh, it depends on where you're looking to buy housing. Uh, for example, on the island, the size of housing you want. And uh, Mr. Speaker, this, this is why uh, what we're seeing here is, uh, is some developers and, and even government looking at, uh, at trending towards higher density, especially in the higher price urban areas. Uh, so Mr. Speaker, it's a, definitely a complex issue, and it's one we're going to continue to work on. Thank you. Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I keep hearing that, yet when we look at something simple like zoning, to actually do that density building, we don't see that from the government. When an investor buys a home, the goal is to extract the maximum profit. So they'll do what they can to flip the property or raise the rent as high as they can. This takes more money away from renters, who would otherwise spend it in the community and support the local economy. It lets money trickle up to the already wealthy, which is bad for islanders and bad for the economy. Question to the minister. Why are you allowing investors to buy up more and more homes instead of cracking down on this profiteering so that every islander can afford to buy or rent a home? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Social Development and Housing. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, there's a lot of assumptions uh, in the preamble to that question about uh, speculation on the island and how much it is and this idea of profiteering. And in fact, uh, when I talk with the experts uh, in my department, and uh, I'm looking forward to going to the federal provincial tutorial meeting uh, here in, in at the uh, end of June, uh, what we find is that really um, developers uh, have, a, have a role to play in providing affordable housing to islanders and it's something that in particular on PEI we have very strong rent controls that have allowed to happen that to happen for many years and so uh, Mr. Speaker we're going to continue to in this current uh, market uh, look for a solution that accommodates both tenants and landlords so we can have the best affordable housing going forward with our new residential tenancy act thank you Mr. Speaker the honorable leader of the official opposition Mr. Speaker. Tourism season is just around the corner and, and our provincial parks are going to be full of, I hope, for the first time in a couple of years. One facility that many campers, and many of them of course are islanders, appreciate when they're using these parks is access to the internet. Two years ago, questions about the half million dollar contract to provide Wi-Fi to provincial parks uncovered a bit of a conflict. <laughs> that bothered the minister. Despite four bids from island companies, the contract was awarded to a New Brunswick firm. The employee involved in this, and again, the, the minister's words, bit of a conflict, has since been removed from his position. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Two years ago, you were unsure whether the island companies who bid for the contract got a fair shake, and you ordered an investigation. What was the outcome of that investigation? The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member. So uh, what came back was uh, that there was not a conflict and uh, it was rectified. Uh, what I can safely say now is that all the campgrounds have uh, good service internet. I know the Honourable Member from uh, O'Leary uh, uh, Inverness certainly had an issue with Cedar Dunes and we were able to rectify that this summer. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition, final question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Last week, our office heard from an islander who's concerned about her neighbor who has serious health issues and whose lack of a reliable cell signal led to a life and death situation. They can't get internet or cell phone service unless they stand out in their balcony or they go to the end of their driveway. And during a recent medical emergency, they had to stand out on the deck to get 911 service. And when they finally got a signal, they had to make a choice between hanging up in order to go to their loved one inside or to continue on the line and forget about their desperately sick partner. A question to the Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Why do we still have pockets on PEI where service is so poor that it's literally putting people's lives at risk? Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture.
agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, that's a very good question, honorable member. It's uh, it's probably one of my uh, biggest pet peeves right now is uh, is the dead zones across Prince Edward Island while while traveling. Uh, so this was an issue that's been going on for a couple of years. So uh, we took the initiative through the department uh, to uh, to get out all across Prince Edward Island to find all the dead zones, uh, which took a period of uh, approximately six months. We were able to provide that data to uh, the telephone providers uh, and and show them where our gaps are. So uh, the department is working with those providers to fill them gaps. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. End of question, Perry. Yes, the Honourable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, just I beg your indulgence for a moment, just for some greetings. Uh, we had a very distinguished individual just join us here uh, a few moments ago, Mr. Maitland McIsaac. Uh, Mate, uh, as, as everyone uh, would know, is a member of the class of 2021 Order of PEI, along with uh, Noreen Corrigan Murphy and uh, our very own Dr. Heather Morrison. Uh, Mate, it's great to see you here in the house today and uh, all the wonderful things you've done over the years for uh, Islanders, not only in the education field, but uh, many other fields as well. And by the looks of it, I'd say while you were traveling into Charlottetown, you probably stopped in Cornwall for a haircut. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister Statements, the Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Family Violence Prevention Week is May 9th to 15th, and all Islanders are invited to participate in activities happening across the province to raise awareness and learn more about how to prevent family violence. This year's theme is the impact of family violence on children and youth. The impact of domestic and family violence on children is immense and can often affect them for the rest of their lives. Violence can cause physical and emotional harm to children and young people, whether they see it, experience it, or are impacted in any way. Family violence can happen to anyone and at all ages. It takes many forms with impacts that go beyond direct physical injury. Mr. Speaker, next week, communities and organizations across the island will hold events including community walks, family events, workshops, and information sessions. We are all encouraged to wear purple throughout the week to help raise awareness and remember victims of violence and their families. I want to thank the Premier's Action Committee on Family Violence for the work they do on behalf of Islanders, as well as all of our community partners. I encourage everyone to take an active role in Family Violence Prevention Week and to help break the silence surrounding family violence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's hard to believe that Family Violence Prevention Week is back again already. It feels like it just happened. That year went really, really fast. Um, as the Minister mentioned, uh, I want to thank the Minister for bringing forward this statement. And, and as she mentioned, we know the impacts of, um, of family violence on children and youth. And, and that being the theme this year, it's really important that, that we take a step back and really think about what that means. And you know, when we consider the traumatic, um, how traumatic it is for a child to live through family violence, that ha literally has lifelong impacts. And if we don't really take a strong effort on working harder at getting, you know, at, at educating people on this and, and really trying to stop family violence, we're going to continue to have this one in five island children's walking children walking through our island schools traumatized and we don't see them we're not equipped we don't have the the uh, counseling supports in place in schools or the community to support that and if we did um, people would be able to do much more proactive work and contribute and help to the work that the Premier's Action Committee do. And I would like to thank the Premier's Action Committee for the work that they do. And I would encourage government to really, really take this, to, regardless of your portfolio, regardless of what position you hold in government, we're the leaders in the province and it's up to us to, to lead the way. And this is one of the hugest problems in our province that we don't talk about. So thank you for, for bringing it up and uh, we have lots of work to do and I look forward to that continued work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty and the third party House Leader. Well, thank you, Minister, for bringing this forward. And, you know, as you're sitting here, and it's an important week and, and I, I've been lucky enough to play a role in in this in the in the past and, and you're looking at things that don't don't correlate together and that's violence and children and youth and that's what we're looking at so it's an important week to educate ourselves we, we're just coming out of a pandemic and i think we were all 
we were all looking at the pandemic and saying, oh no, I hope everybody's okay. And a lot of great Islanders did a lot of great things to protect children and youth around from violence. But we have to continue to look at the culture of that and the cycle of that. Um, and with kids, and because it'll affect their mental health and their upbringing. So um, bystander training becomes a very important aspect of this. If you see something happening, please reach out. And if you're a kid who can't reach out to your p parents for whatever reason, please call the kids' helpline. It's there for you. Call, pick it up, figure out how to dial that number, and make sure that you're safe. Um, I want to say there's also the PEI Family Violence Prevention Services 24-hour crisis support line. And a lot of the root cause has to do with men and, and boys. We have to do better. Men and boys have to do better on this front, and, and we have to take that responsibility on. So thank you for bringing this forward, and this is a very serious and important topic. Thank you. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Land, Justice, Public Safety, and Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg to table Justice and Public Safety budget take backs, and I move seconded by the Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier. Anyone else? Tabling? No? Uh, reports by committees. The Honourable Member for Monaco, Kilmuir, and the Government Whip. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability, and following the receipt of report on committee activities of the said committee on April 29, 2022, I move, seconded by the Honourable Member from O'Leary and Burness, that the report of the committee be adopted. Your committee met with the Department of Agriculture and Land, Department of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, the PEI Potato Board, and the PEI Federation of Agriculture. Your committee has also met on two separate occasions with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And as a result of its del deliberations, your committee is pleased to make the following recommendation to the members of the Legislative Assembly. Your committee recommends that government take index fields with de detected potato board out of any type of agricultural production which disturbs the soil in perpetuity. The idea of taking index fields out of production was discussed with many of the groups who presented during your committee series of meetings on the topic of potato wart. In the committee's first meeting with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, it was said that there have been discussions with the province on removing index fields not only from potato production, but from any type of agricultural production. It is of the committee's belief that these fields should be permanently taken out of agricultural practices with which disturb, disturb the soil. Your committee also heard from the Department of Agriculture and Land, who st stated that taking these fields out of production was a focus of the department and are moving towards doing so. Your committee supports this initiative while encouraging use of the land in other ways that, that does not disrupt, disrupt the soil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to the report? No? Should I carry? Carry. Introduction of government bills. Motions other than government, or orders other than government. The Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford and the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I ask that Motion 117 be now read. Should I carry? Carry. Motion 117. The member for Charlottetown Belvedere moves, seconded by the leader of the official opposition, the following motion. Whereas inflation on PEI is the highest it has ever been in decades and is consistently the highest in the country. And whereas the cost of goods has increased significantly, including necessities like groceries, home heating, and gasoline. And whereas Islanders, especially those on fixed or low incomes, including seniors, are not able to manage the rising cost of, costs of living. And whereas no Islander should have to choose between paying rent or mor mortgage, buying groceries, or filling a prescription. And whereas PEI has the lowest wages in the country, which makes it harder for Islanders to manage rises to the cost of living. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to take clear action to reduce the impact of inflation on Islanders by increasing the income thresholds for programs and services, including but not limited to the catastrophic drug program, dental program, efficiency PEI, and Seniors Independence Initiative. 
Therefore, be it further resolved, the Legislative Assembly urge government to consider additional relief measures, including but not limited to a moratorium on rent increases, increasing the carbon rebate, and accelerating the implementation of a universal basic income guarantee. And therefore, be it further resolved that the Legislative Assembly urge government to ensure that relief measures are delivered to Islanders in a timely manner. Yeah. Over on the motion, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere to start debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Usually when we rise for motions, we say it's a pleasure to rise. But Mr. Speaker, it's not. Um, I'm, I'm not pleased to rise to have to speak about something that is affecting Islanders so dramatically um, and that we are seeing so little really direct effort or discussion of any meaningful type happening um, in this House. We have consistently heard the list, um, um, the screensaver list of the, of the various, and they are great, there are great programs. We, there is no doubt that there are islanders who would not be able to heat their home if they didn't have access to the Salvation, home, Salvation Army home heating program. We know that food bank usage right now is the highest it has ever been in history. Mr. Speaker, and the food bank is genuinely concerned about whether they're going to be able to maintain the stocks that they need to meet the need. The community fridge is empty 30 seconds after it's filled. Um, you know, there are, there are multiple places that, that we have able to put pieces of money that help where we are right now. But this is about asking for immediate, decisive action. And part of that is that we have to actually talk about this as a real, current, and ongoing problem. Mr. Speaker, this is not a temporary blip that if we can ignore it long enough or move some you know, deck chairs around, it'll go away. Um, even if we see a rapid drop um, in inflation and the associated cost of goods, we're not going to see those cost of goods drop in the, with the same rapidity. That's just not how the market works. Um, you know, we are obviously subject to costs as a result of being an island, and that means cost of shipping, cost of transportation is a key piece, the cost of actually moving ourselves around the province, the fact that we are still incredibly oil dependent, despite the big strides that have been made in electrification and green energy, it is still, even with free heat pumps, a fraction of households. We talk about, I think the minister has told us, 2,000 households have taken the advantage of the free heat home heat pump program. There are 45,000 households haven't. So, you know, that the, the ratios um, aren't going to make that much of a difference at this point, even though the intent is good. It also obviously still doesn't address the large number of people who are left out of all of these programs, and that is, you know, the average islander. That is an islander who has a job, or is working poor, who is a senior with a fixed income, um, who is a renter, uh, is a student. Um, who lives in rural PEI and needs their car, who are, um, have many different reasons that they either can't access the programs that are available or they're locked out of the programs because of the conditions that we put on them, um, or who are just not seeing how they're going to be able to bridge the difference that happens when your oil bill goes up 80% in four months. It's not like we didn't see this coming, Mr. Speaker. Inflation has been consistently the highest in the country in PEI. This is not a blip, it's a trend. The cost of goods in terms of goods that we have to have shipped here is not a surprise. We've known about this. It's not, again, like we didn't see it coming. And where this hurts the most, though everybody is feeling it, are for those who have a limited income. Um, and we're talking not then about those people, about people who live in poverty, though obviously they were already in desperate straits, and this is certainly not going to make it any easier. But we're talking about people who might have just been out managing to make it work before because they were on a fixed income, but their budget worked for them. And I, especially in my district, Mr. Speaker, that's seniors. Whether it's, it's individual seniors who are often women or whether it's couples, they are now looking at their bills saying, I don't know how we're going to do this. What are we going to stop doing? How do you choose what you stop doing when you already do so little because your budget that leaves you no room? What do you pick? What do you pick between paying your rent and your mortgage, paying your bills, buying groceries, or filling a prescription? How do you choose? Do you give up your pets? Do you stop seeing your friends? Do you give up driving like some of the seniors in my district have told me they're going to do? They're selling their cars. Now, great, they can get a bus pass. But when you give up your car, and you've always had a car, this is the other reality. You're giving up your independence and your autonomy. 
There's a lot to that, Mr. Speaker, about mental health and our social connections in our community. And when we don't have bus services that provide the flexibility that we need yet, there's a big gap between what we could do and what we should do. One of the biggest things that we can do, Mr. Speaker, obviously, would be wage parity. We would be talking about that we know that the gap now is the biggest that it's ever been between how much people earn and how much they need to earn to actually have a decent living. And, and the last time the study was done, which is obviously completely out of date because of what's happened with inflation, it was $19.30 an hour. Well, we're at, what, thirteen seventy-five? I think, if I'm looking at my colleague, I think it's that, about that. So there was already you know, a, a, a huge gap. And obviously, with inflation, that's going to be even bigger. The buying power of somebody who works 50 or 60 hours a week is not enough to cover the basic cost of living. You actually have to be earning, or sorry, working at minimum wage at least 65 hours a week. Mr. Speaker, that's why so many people who are not on social assistance, they're not on disability allowance, they are working their butts off, Mr. Speaker, and they're doing two jobs, three jobs. They're exhausted. They are working and sleeping. And they're just making it through. They're living on craft dinner, and they have no hope of saving. They have no emergency fund. They have a quality of life, which I don't think is what we thought we were going to be when we grew up. I don't think anybody aspires to be working themselves into an early grave. And Mr. Speaker, it is, it is a space of despair and worry and concern, and people can see, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to work towards that? How is that something that I would want? And that's not the case for everybody. Obviously, we've got a whole population of people who don't have that reality. But the gap between those that are fine and those that are not is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And no matter what we hear from the other side of the House, this is something that we can actually do something about, yes, Cost of living, inflation costs are driven from a global perspective by global markets, absolutely. But that does not mean that there are not actions that the provincial government can and should take that will assist beyond band-aid short-term shortcut measures and that will reach more people in more spaces beyond those who fit only into certain buckets. The simplest of these to begin with is something that we've been calling for for a long time, and that is to, to address the income thresholds for programs and services, which are absolutely excellent, but are so limited by the conditions that are put on them that so many people are not eligible to apply. That includes things like we talked about that in the House, the heat pump program, and how rapidly the minister pivoted and expanded the income level that was required to be able to form maximum eligibility on that program because he was the first to acknowledge that it was not reflective of the actual need in the community or what income thresholds actually should reflect. But it's very worrying when we talk about income thresholds over and over and, and we, everybody on that side of the house looks to the Minister of Social Development and Housing as if he's the only one that has anything to do with setting an income threshold. I know he doesn't think it's important enough to listen to. but. Income thresholds for programs and services show up in multiple departments across government. They show up in things like the catastrophic drug program, which currently has a threshold, which I just checked this morning, of $20,000, Mr. Speaker. And after $20,000, you have to pay 3% of your annual income. And honestly, for people, if people are earning $20,000, they don't have 1500 bucks, which is 3% of their income. You have $20,000. That's all you've got. Or the um, dental program, which we've heard, very confusing about what the thresholds are, or how they're set, where do they come from, nobody knows. Pick a number, we made it up. The Seniors Independence Initiative, or Efficiency PEI, where we've pushed for the, the, that change to happen with the heat pump program, but they're still using, using different thresholds for different things, depending on who you talk to. Or, as we heard from my colleague from Summerside Wilmot just yesterday, the legal aid which is set at a threshold so low that people on social assistance can't qualify. In fact, the threshold for legal aid is 50% of the market basket measure. The market basket measure, Mr. Speaker, is the official legislated measure of poverty as per the legislation we passed in this House last year. It is the government's responsibility to actually implement that legislation. at a loss to understand why this government is taking 
over a year now to actually put in place a very simple, straightforward, universal benchmark of an income threshold. If the income threshold is the market basket measure, that's the income threshold that at the minimum anyone should be required to meet to be able to qualify for programs. Obviously higher is better, but that's the lowest that it should be as an income threshold. If you are earning at or below market basket measure, you qualify. I don't know why that's so hard. You would think with this many programs that it would actually be easier to have one income threshold, one set of conditions and qualification, and then roll that out across every single department, and you think that maybe we could have done that in the year or more we've had since that became the law. Mr. Speaker, only government can act on implementing legislation. The House writes the legislation, the House debates the legislation, the House passes or not. But when it's passed and it is proclaimed and becomes law, it's that side of the House, it's their job to do that work. And they are letting islanders down. We're asked all the time to bring solutions. We did the hard work for you. Why are you continuing to stumble on something so straightforward? The Minister of Justice, Public Safety has said, well, we're going to go back and look at it. You don't have to. The market basket measure is almost $35,000 a year for an individual, and your threshold for legal aid is $17,000. That's 50%. Yeah. It's wrong. It's wrong, and you know what? It's illegal, because your own law says it's illegal. You need to get that sorted. This is as simple as we can make it. I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, maybe we need to do a set-by-set -set instructions at this point. But, Mr. Speaker, just changing that income threshold to be clear, universal, and universally implemented across all the departments not only simplifies qualification, but it means that everybody in the community knows what those benchmarks are. They understand where it came from. They understand that it's fair. It is set on the actual cost of goods. So it means that market basket measure as determined by Statistics Canada, will change as things get more expensive. That means the market basket measure, when it is next assessed, is going to reflect the cost of living. Imagine that. How do you address the cost of living provincially? You set your benchmarks to serve the benchmark of cost of living. And yes, it means that it will cost more to deliver programs because, funnily enough, when you increase the benchmark, when you increase the threshold, more people become eligible. And let's be clear, Mr. Speaker, that's why those benchmarks stay low. Yes, yep. exactly. You know, fiscally responsible does not mean denying people access to services. You heard me talk about this earlier when I talked about abortion access, that you oppress people when you refuse them access to services by putting barriers in the way that require them to meet conditions that are not possible. When we do not meet and provide clear access to services that we are legally required to, Mr. Speaker, by our own law, then we are denying access for people who should and will benefit from those services, whether it's legal aid or dental services or catastrophic drugs or free heat pumps. And Mr. Speaker, I, I recognize the cost is there, but the other aspect of this is that we have to, as a, as, as a government and as a society, put back into our society. When our economy is on a tear, as our previous Premier, Mr. Wade McLaughlin, was fond of saying, when the economy is on a tear, it can't be only the people at the top that benefit from that. Everybody has to be able to benefit. It, a rising tide benefits everyone. And what happens in our economy right now is there is no rising tide. There's a flood and there's a drought and there's nothing in between. So, Mr. Speaker, yes, it, there will be more of an expense on some of these programs, but don't you think that that is only fair, that we reinvest and we subsidize and we take the pressure off people who need it. Because frankly, if you need to access the legal aid services or the catastrophic drug program, you're not doing that because you're bored and looking for something to do on a Saturday. You're doing that because you need drugs to save your life. You're doing that because you're going into a court case that is going to change your future. You need dental care because you haven't been for 10 years. You need a heat pump because you can't afford your oil tank anymore. People are not doing this to waste government's money, Mr. Speaker. They're doing it because they're members of our society. The 
And Mr. Speaker, we are also in this motion having provided clarity on what seems to be a very obvious, if not simple, activity of balancing and ratifying or, um, the, uh, the thresholds for access to programs and services, urging government to consider additional relief me measures that are within their purview to do, that are within the scope of the provincial government. We have obviously, through, act, through legislative activity on the floor of the House, been able to implement the current moratorium on rent evictions, which was a specific and direct action to halt um, illegal um, evictions on, under the cause of renovation by bad faith landlords. And it had an immediate and measurable impact of over 160 files, active files, halting. And, and preventing homelessness for those, those uh, files. If you don't know those numbers, Ms. Um, Minister, that's not my problem. Obviously, we do on this side of the House because we listen to people. But the next piece that, that need, we would urge government to consider are, is a moratorium on rent increases. Because despite the Minister's uh, um, uh, you know, um, assurances that we are a rent control province, we all know that that is not true. There is, a legis there is legislation in place that says we should be. There is IRAC and a rentals board that says that we should be. But the reality is that day after day after day, we are having to help and assist clients from every aspect of this province who are being faced with rent increases in the double digits and then having to go through the terrible, stressful, onerous process of appealing that. I know my colleague from Summerside, Wilmot, has a number of cases on the go right now where the rent increases are over 40 per cent. I have had one in my district. Um, and I know my colleague in Summerside, uh, Victoria Park, has had one just recently with six residents where it was, the average was 35%. Um, these are not uncommon. Um, and so, you know, there, there is obviously an opportunity in the absence of the Residential Tenancy Act coming forward in any timely manner, seeing as it's in some kind of residential tenancy limbo, that in the interim we could add to the um, effect of the rent eviction moratorium by bringing in a temporary but effective moratorium on rent increases above those that are currently within the legislation across the board. Because Islanders should not have to be put into the situation of the financial and mental stress that comes with having to fight your eviction or a rent increase of hundreds of dollars, which we all know is illegal, but will happen because what else can you do when you've got nowhere to go? One of the other aspects that we would also want to see is that we, as we have called for on numerous occasions in the House, is that we move to a larger carbon rebate delivered on a quarterly basis that will provide all qualifying households with a, um, a, uh, a rebate check that would look somewhere between, it feels like $150 to $200, depending on what day of the week it is, um, and but that would come on a semi-regular basis, which means those households could count on that money to at least help them you know, um, on a rolling basis with some of the, the immediate sticker shock that comes with the current grocery prices, gas prices, and oil prices. We know, again, that the funds are there and that all of the programs that could be funded, that are currently being funded by reallocating the money being taken in by the proposed carbon levy, could be funded from within the existing contingency fund with money left over. There is flexibility to be able to find alternative sources of funding that do not stretch government beyond its capacity to deliver and recognizing that it is government's responsibility to find that balance. And we're asking for the balance to change. We're asking for the balance to change in the favor of providing direct rebates to island households and provide the programs and services to encourage the transition to a greener economy. We can do both. This is not an either or equation. It's an and and an and. And finally, Mr. Speaker, we want to encourage there to be more and positive action on accelerating the implementation of a basic income guarantee. A letter is not enough. It's wonderful, but it's not enough. And if you're not fighting for it because you don't believe that it really matters, then you know, you're not fighting for it. And we believe it really matters. We believe that that acceleration of transition from our existing social programs to one that is not conditional, to one that is actually designed to recognize and value individuals, for one that is designed to value them and how they contribute to society and not just to economy. That's the future. That's the future. We have shown in PEI that we can be different. We can be leaders. We have shown in PEI, at least for a period of time, that we could be first. 
that we, were, we can be first in how we adapt and support our, each other, that we can be first in how we take care of each other, that we can be first in how we roll out the programs and services that help people keep it all together. But we don't want to be first in cost of living. We don't want to be first in the impact of inflation. We don't want to be first in how many people have to use the food bank or how many people are facing homelessness or how many people are having to make really difficult decisions that will impact their quality of life that none of us in this house necessarily are going to have to make. But we all know somebody who, who does. And if you don't, then you're not talking to the right people. And I wish you would think this was more important than your phones. You know what? You talk a lot in here about being embarrassed. I am embarrassed to stand in this house and watch ministers of this house who think that they shouldn't have to pay attention. You're not paying attention. And I am really sad that you think that this is an appropriate behavior in this house where you represent the people of this province and you don't think that it's important enough to listen. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I would really look forward to hearing from other members of the house, but I'm afraid I'm just going to hear the same things I've heard before. Now they're going to be upset because I've called them out. But you know what, Mr. Speaker? It's tough. It's tough to hear that maybe you're not doing as good a job as you think you are. But that's what Islanders are telling us. They're worried, and they need someone to be stepping up for them. And they're waiting. And they're hearing you talk, but they're not hearing you act. This is your chance. You asked us for ideas. We're giving you ideas. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my Honourable Colleague from Charlottetown, Belvedere, has started by saying it's customary when you stand up to say it's a pleasure to stand up and talk to this motion and then explained why for her today it, it was not a pleasure and she expounded on that in her comments. Well, I can tell you it's, it's also not a pleasure for me and for a different reason. Um, I, I've got a bit of background story here, Mr. Speaker. I used to play a, um, a lot of music as a young man and I, uh, I sort of cut my teeth uh, in a, in a jazz band, a, a really pretty decent jazz band back, back in Glasgow. And uh, there was one particular trombone player in the jazz band who was a brilliant improviser, fantastic player as a young, a young man. And all of us in the band used to dread being the person who would have to stand up after he had played his solo and, and do something. <laughs> and that's how I feel right now, Mr. Speaker. I've listened to my honourable colleague from Charlottetown, Belvedere, speak with very few notes, um, with a great depth of understanding and knowledge and sensitivity and vigour, I might say, on the issue of cost of living. And for those of us who are elected members of this House and are charged with listening to our constituents and indeed all islanders, about the issues of the day. I think I can speak for every single person in this House that far and away the thing that we've been hearing most about over the last few months anyway, and perhaps a bit more than that, but definitely over the last few months, is the cost of living and how difficult it is here on Prince Edward Island to just pay for the necessities that we all have. And as my honourable colleague stated in her remarks, we're a privileged bunch in here. And the likelihood is that none of us is faced with making very difficult economic choices for our families from month to month. But we all know that is not the case for thousands and thousands of our friends and neighbours. And it's our duty, it's our obligation, it's our responsibility to be sensitive to the concerns and the needs of the people that we share this island with. The first conditional clause of this motion talks about how inflation is the highest it's ever been here on Prince Edward Island, currently at around 9% and not looking like it's going to go down anytime soon. In fact, the economists tell us that it's likely to be here for some time to come, perhaps gradually reducing over the, little, the next little while, but it's not going to go away anytime fast. And you could say, well, the whole world is faced with the same situation. We see inflation, of course, in every G7 country and, in fact, in some developing countries, much higher rates of inflation that, than we're experiencing here in Canada. 
But within the G7 countries, Canada and the US are, are out in front, not in a good way, when it comes to the level of inflation. I tried to find the most recent numbers and, uh, and couldn't find anything more recent than a few months ago, at a time when Canada and the US were running at about twice of the average inflation rate for the G7 countries. So yes, this is happening everywhere, but it's not happening equally everywhere. And Canada is one of the places where inflation is taking a much bigger bite out of people's finances than other countries. And then we will, when we look inside Canada, Canada who is the front runner when it comes to the rate of inflation, we find ourselves, the little province of Prince Edward Island, again, out front and not in a good way. Our inflation rate here is considerably higher than not just the average of the provinces, but the next highest province. We are a real outlier. So when we say, yes, inflation is a problem, but it's a problem everywhere, it's a particular and it's a, it's a particularly vicious problem here on Prince Edward Island. And then you have to say, well, what control, what responsibility, if any, does the government have in dealing with that? If we are indeed an outlier, why is that? What is it about our circumstances here which mean that Prince Edward Island is actually in a much worse position than our neighbours and friends? And what can or should government do about that? Well, a recent analysis suggested that the two main drivers of our hyped up inflation are the cost of gas and the cost of housing, cost of um, whether, whether you're renting or whether you're, you're, you own a house. Those are the two factors that seem to be out of line with other provinces. Now, of course, the cost of gas is something that is, you might say, is completely outside the control of not just a domestic national government, but a subnational government like Prince Edward Island. And you can make a good argument that that's the case. And of course, world events can dramatically impact the cost of crude oil and refined oil, and therefore all of the products that come from that. So what can you do about that? Well, perhaps not very much. But what you can do as a government is that you can reduce your dependence on those fossil fuels over which we have no control. And in doing so, you can insulate, to a certain extent, your economy from the vagaries of, of the global economy and the ups and downs, mostly ups, of course, of the cost of things like gas. And we have seen some efforts, to be fair, from this government to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels. We were, before this administration took over, a leader in Canada in terms of our move to clean, renewable energy, whether that be to power our homes or, well, not so much our transit system, although we're starting to do that now. But we are in a pretty decent place. But we cannot be complacent about this. We have to do considerably more than we are. And there's been a lot of talk recently, and we will no doubt debate these bills in the, up, in the, in the days coming forward, of the carbon pricing rebate, and of what an effective tool that is in moving people away from fossil fuels. But it only works if it's properly applied. And when it is properly applied, not only does it nudge people towards cleaner, greener options, but it can also provide those who use less fossil fuels, and those would be people in lower income brackets, with more money in their pockets than they actually pay out in carbon tax. So not only can it be a way of improving our GHG footprint here in Prince Edward Island, it can be, if you like, uh, a wealth distribution, a wealth redistribution. And it still pains me that this government has had three years to negotiate a much better deal with the federal government, and yet it looks like we're going to end up with something very similar to what they inherited from the previous administration, which was, which was for islanders, not a good deal. For the environment, a terrible deal. So while governments may not be able to control the price of commodities, like fossil fuels, they absolutely have opportunities to reduce 
the jurisdictional dependence on those. And we have not done all we can in that regard, very far from what we can in that regard. I'm delighted to see a public transit system being brought out here on Prince Edward Island, but it's in its infancy. And um, while I applaud the work that's being done, I think we all know that for that to be a true replacement for people to get them out of their cars, it has to be comprehensive and it has to be convenient. And at the moment, it is neither of those things. But it's a start, and, I, and I, I, I want to applaud government for that, because you have to start somewhere. But we need, as the caucus on this side of the House has been arguing for, we need significant investment, investment beyond simply putting the funds from carbon tax back into those programs. We need extra investment in green, clean technologies in order to move us faster towards the future that we all need. The second driver of the hyperinflation that we see here on Prince Edward Island is the cost of housing. And again, PEI is an outlier. If you look at the increases in rent across the country, we are, uh, again, there was a Global Mail study, and I wish I had the, the numbers at my fingertips, but we are much, much higher than other jurisdictions. I know it's been four, 14 point something percent over the last couple of years, which is, I think, double the average. So again, this isn't normal. This is not customary inflation. This is something peculiar about Prince Edward Island, which is causing this. And I would argue it's peculiar because we have a government that has not put in place the proactive measures that could have both reduced our dependence on fossil fuels in the first place and also controlled the housing market here. And there's been a terrible failure when it comes to regulating the housing market here in a way that could have had a that could have made a real difference for islanders. And we're talking here about regulations of short-term rentals, and that has slowly and painfully slowly come along. But with no help from this provincial government, we're looking at possibilities of vacancy taxes, of stepped um, deposit requirements for those second and third homes, of regulating real estate investment trusts, REITs, in a way that actually benefits local landlords. Currently, REITs do not pay income. They, they do not pay tax on income if you do not live in Prince Edward Island. And increasingly, REITs are responsible for a large number of rental properties here on Prince Edward Island. And local landlords who may have one, two, four, five, six, ten properties here that they are renting, but they live on Prince Edward Island, are paying significant tax. Those who are part of a REIT do not pay on that tax here on Prince Edward Island. That's a, that's a real disadvantage to local landlords. And yet this government has done nothing to rein in or put in a tax system in place that would at least create a level playing field for local landowners, uh, local uh, landlords here on Prince Edward Island. All of these are real missed opportunities when it comes to government being proactive in creating a, a, an environment, an economic environment here, where Prince Edward Island could not be the outlier um, at the top of the pile, but actually could be the outlier at the bottom of the pile by protecting our economy here, particularly those low-income islanders who are struggling to get by day after day after day. We, of course, put forward a motion on bringing in LPA-style regulations on, on uh, housing here on Prince Edward Island, which was voted down unanimously by government members and by third-party members. That was an opportunity to say, you care about islanders who are looking to get a roof over their heads, whether that's rental or, or to get into the ownership market. And in every other corner of this house, you said, no, we prefer to let the free market determine what happens. And that's why Prince Edward Island is in the worst place in Canada, and in many respects, it's almost in the worst place in the world when it comes to the rate of inflation. It's shameful. And of course, this has happened in a very sudden and intense way. Um, inflation is something that comes and goes. You, you look back at, at the history of economics here on Prince Edward Island and Canada and around the world, and things happen in cycles, and we understand that. Um, 
But this has been a particularly severe, particularly sudden, and particularly intense increase in inflation. And it's hit PEI harder than almost anywhere else. And when you start with the lowest wages in the country, which is what we have, the impact that that has on the lower, on, on people who are in low and middle income families here on Prince Edward, Edward Island is really exaggerated. And so an inflation rate of 9% and housing costs, which are, I mean, I heard a story today of a, of, of a house that went for $200,000 over asking here on Prince Edward Island. You know, the idea that my children who are, you know, in decent paying jobs could actually find their way into the housing market if they were to start today is very unlikely and that's a very sad thing. And I do think the government has a responsibility and an opportunity to do something about that and they have not. My honourable colleague talked a lot about the qualifying criteria for the programs, whether that's a dental program, heat pump program or whatever. And I, I'm not going to repeat the, mar the remarks that she made, except that I do think it's really important that that point is made crystal clear to government and to those who are listening, that we have programs indeed, and government is proud to talk about those programs, sometimes repeatedly in back-to-back in -back questions during question period. <laughs> but those programs are only beneficial if islanders who need them can actually access oh them. And that is not the case here. So yes, we have some great programs, but we also have some great obstacles for those who most need those programs, being able to use them. And I'm not suggesting that this is a simple, quick, easy thing to fix. It absolutely is not. Economies are, uh, have their own momentum. They have, uh, there, there is so much wrapped up uh, in a local economy, in, a, in our case, our provincial economy, that turning that around, changing it, is not something that can be done overnight. And I absolutely understand that. And I'm not going to stand here and suggest that any of these changes are going to be easy or quick. They're not. But I do think that we have to look at the economy in a different way. And I think that we have to start not just looking at the gross domestic product, which is, of course, just a uh, a, a conglomerate of all of the goods and services that are sold in a jurisdiction over a period of time and pays no attention whatsoever to whether those goods and services are producing beneficial results for the citizens of that place. I think we need to move away from a gross domestic product as, as the sole way that we measure the health and the well-being of an economy to something called genuine progress indicators, which take into account far more, yes, housework in our communities. We should be looking at the percentage of islanders who are able to access higher education, their access to primary health care services, to, to economic equality in our communities. All of these things are much broader and in many ways much clearer and truer indicators of well-being in our society than just whether our economy is bigger this year than it was last year. And genuine progress indicators also take into account things which are not going so well. If we have increasing inequality in our community, and my colleague talked about that, she talked about uh, a rising tide uh, uh, lifting all boats, and then went on to say it's not a rising tide, we have a flood and we have a drought. We have increasing inequality in our community, and a GDP would not tell you that, but genuine progress indicator would say, wait a minute, Yes, our economy is growing, but it's the benefits of that are going disproportionately to those who need it least. Okay. And those who need it most are being left behind. And that's not an indicator of a healthy economy. Genuine progress indicator looks at the level of pollution. It looks at the level of crime. It looks at, it, it looks at losses in the environment. All of these things are critical to the well-being of our, of our communities. And I think we absolutely must, rather than look at just GDP, look in a more holistic way at the well-being of our province's economy and of our community. And that will require that we look beyond GDP. I'd, I'm going to stop. I have so many more things I would love to say. Um, but I'm also looking forward to hearing what others think about this. Is the cost of living an issue for you? Is it an issue for your constituents? And if so, 
what do you think we should do about it? Our side of the House has been extraordinarily forthcoming for the last three years with the solutions that we think could be brought in to nudge our economy to something that will support our province in, time, in, in times to come so that we have genuine prosperity here and a sustainable, developed economy for years to come, supporting the most vulnerable in our community, and ideas on what we could do to secure a housing market that actually makes it affordable for those who want to live here, those who are born here, those who come here. So I really have enjoyed the opportunity to talk a little bit about the, the, the problems that we have here and also some solutions, but I'm much more interested in hearing from others, and I, I thank you for the time this afternoon, uh, Mr. Speaker, and look forward to the debate. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Summerside South Drive. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The official opposition mentioned he wanted to hear what we're hearing from our constituents and how he wanted to rise and just bring forward the experience of some of my constituents recently relating to this issue. So uh, this person was living uh, in an apartment and was what they called renovicted, so they no longer have a, a place of their own to live. They're living with their family at the moment, but uh, they have a medical diagnosis that makes dealing with stairs difficult, and there's plenty of stairs in order to access where the, that family is right now. So they're not living in suitable conditions, and they need some seniors' housing. The threshold for qualifying for seniors' housing is $33,000, and the department was quite clear in their response to them that, sorry, you make just a tiny bit too much just a tiny bit, no help. So then you contrast that with uh, what the Honourable Member uh, from Charlottetown Be Belvedere was talking about with the market basket kind of measure. And government kind of does this for themselves. Uh, the property taxes that they collect each year go up based on the CPI, the amount of inflation. So the amount of money the government takes in goes up when property values go up. So they've got more money, but they're not, they don't have a similar policy, corresponding policy, for all of these housing policies that are benefiting islanders. So here I have a constituent who last year wouldn't have qualified, and perhaps the perhaps it's debatable that threshold was set at the right place. Now one year later, we're nearing 10% increase, 8.9%, 9 8.9% 9 increase in inflation. Their income hasn't changed. Um, it's now worth less. They can buy less. They can't get as much food. They can't drive as far. They can't do as much with that money. But now they don't qualify for the government's housing program. The government's taking in more money based on the value of housing, and this person can no longer afford housing. So you see there's a, quite a disconnect between how the government sees this and how it rolls out these programs for my constituents, for everybody's constituents. Why on earth don't, isn't this income threshold of 33,000 adjusted based on inflation, just like the money that's taken in? Why isn't the money that's going out with the corresponding housing policies adjusted? It makes no sense. So now this constituent is thrust into the housing market, and we've heard plenty about that. I've spoken about it. Pretty much every member on this side of the House has spoken about it. It doesn't seem to be a problem on the other side of the House, but it's a very big problem for this constituent. They have nowhere they can afford to live. They're left hoping that the government will give them a mobile rental voucher. Just, and then, you know what? We're going to take that mobile rental voucher, we're going to put it on housing that's not affordable to begin with, and then we're going to add one to the affordable housing list of, yep, yeah, we've got another affordable housing unit here on PEI. Yeah. No, we do not. <laughs> no, we do not. We have more money going out on a case-by-case -case basis. We need policy. The policy for government is to automatically adjust the money coming in based on inflation. We need a policy from government that automatically adjusts the money going out to islanders based on inflation. It's a failure a massive failure, and it's going to lead to a system collapse. It, it is leading to a system collapse. It's the honourable leader of the official opposition mentioned he thinks about his children. I had a conversation with my 13-year-old recently, and the, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, but his face just dropped when we started talking about he won't be able to afford his own. He just will not. And he said his answer was, well, that'd be okay if wages went up too. And I said, I'm sorry. 
times. Yeah. Not how this is working, son. So at 13, he recognizes how bad that is. But yet, we're not taking any action. We're just sitting here saying, this is fine. It's not fine. No. Got another constituent. They're on social assistance. They need to travel. They get an allowance. The allowance for travel, by what we know with the price of gas price, is doing it's going through the roof. The allowance for travel is not going through the roof. So now they're left at home trying to get access to medic <laughs> trying to get access into the medical system that's hard enough to deal with to begin with, and yet can't even make it to Charlottetown for their appointments. The answer, mind-bogglingly, was no, we won't increase your $30 allowance for travel to Charlottetown, which isn't enough. But if you don't think that's enough, take a taxi for 150 bucks and we'll pay for that. What kind of policy is that? That's ridiculous, Mr. Speaker. It's just wasteful. Come up with a policy that recognizes the costs to islanders and implement them. Have them automatically adjusted. Market basket measures. That's the way to do this. And uh, I could go on and on and on with how this is going to impact Islanders, every Islander across all walks of life. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're a child or if you're a senior, as I've illustrated in my stories here. Everybody's worried about this, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. And nobody's seeing government do anything to tackle the problem at a systemic level. And that's what government's job <laughs> is. Take care of the people set up the systems that will operate. Here we've got a system that's leading to collapse. It's obvious, and yet we'll blindly go into that. And I just, I, I, I can't understand how government can sleep at night knowing that they have the power to stop that, and yet they're willing to vote unanimously against the motion to have a conversation about how we can stop that. Like, just even that minimal effort of let's have a conversation was no. I think I'll end right there, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm surprised that I'm up so quickly on your list. I did expect to hear from some of my Honourable colleagues on the other side of the House about this, but I'm sure you're on the list right after me. I have no doubt. So, Mr. Speaker, it's so important to have an opportunity to speak about the increased cost of living because, as we know, this impacts everything. And I am hearing from seniors in particular in my district who are being impacted in a disproportionate way. This has been a nightmare, Mr. Speaker. And it frustrates me to no end when the Minister of Social Development and Housing stands up during question period and says, we have the strongest rent controls in this province, when he knows full well I can hear him. And he knows that we have had this conversation again and again and again. That's just not true. That's just not true. These are rent controls on paper, Mr. Speaker. I have been there with more seniors in my district who believed that because the allowable increase is 1% or a percent and a half on any given year, that that was all they would see their rent go up. These are people who do not have an ability to increase their earning power when their rent goes up by 30%, by 40%, by in one case 55%, they don't have more money. That's just the fact. It means that we are now deciding between paying that rent or giving up on medication, lowering the quality of their food, missing meals, missing out on birthday parties for their grandchildren. This is not a joke. This is a problem and this is not a one-off situation. I have spoken to the minister about this problem again and again and again, and that's when the cost of living was not what it is right mm -hmm. now. I have more seniors. In one area, I have 80 seniors who are impacted by this. You cannot stand in this house and pretend that we have strong rent controls that are protecting people. We don't, and you know it. And you know it. This is 
definitely, desperately impacting people. It is impacting people in my district. It has to be impacting people in your district. And do you know what, Mr. Speaker, the most frustrating part of all of this is in theory, on paper, if they were able to put together a good case and go before the rental board, they'd have a very real chance of their rent staying affordable and then being able to stay in it. Because with a vacancy rate in Summerside of 1%, when their rent gets unaffordable, it's not like they have somewhere else to go. Like, where should I tell them to go? There's nowhere for them to go. So if they had the ability to put together a good case, they'd have a very real chance of keeping their rents affordable. The parties on the other side have a lawyer preparing their case. They receive literally hundreds of pages of legalese that they have to go through line by line as a 90-year-old senior who has never lived on their own before their husband passed away a few years ago. And she, at 90, is supposed to go through this line by line and refute it. And anything she does not refute, it is assumed that she agrees with, and therefore her rent goes up. So I appeal, can we please, please, please increase the threshold of legal aid and increase what they can help with? Because this is a dire situation for the dozens of seniors in my district. Nope, we're not going to do that. There are things we could do. There are tangible things we could do that would make it more affordable for people right now. And government is choosing not to do it, and that's a choice. My honorable colleague from Charlottetown Belvedere spoke about how we have legislation in place that sets the market basket measure as our minimum threshold for poverty. That's $35,000 approximately. It's probably higher than that now with the cost of inflation. But even if we're going by that figure, I have constituents who are on income support who make too much to qualify for legal aid. Mm -hmm. Like, let me say that again. People on income support are too wealthy for legal aid based on government's definition of what the threshold is for that, despite the fact that we have legislation in place that says our poverty threshold is 35,000 for a single person. Shameful. For a single person. My family that is dealing with this, the constituents that I'm talking about in Summerside, are a family of five. So they are way above, way above what legal aid will cover for them to get the sort of supports that they need. Why are we doing this? There are so many people who are struggling. The Minister of Finance stands and says people need to tighten their belts. These belts don't get tighter. Yeah. Yeah. Like, walk me through how my income support family should be tightening their belt. Like, please get on the list and explain to me what they should be doing to tighten their belt. What about the seniors who are in all those units that I've called the minister about, who are desperately afraid, whose health has been impacted in ways I cannot explain to you by the stress of knowing their rent was going to go up hundreds of dollars every month when they don't have an extra dime? Explain to me how those belts get tighter. If anyone has suggestions on steps they could do, I can tell you they're not expensing things to taxpayers. Yeah. They're not putting down a $500 trailer hitch and saying, oh, taxpayers can pay for that. They don't have an expense account. There are no belts to tighten. You on this side of the house, and again, I can tell by your interest level in this discussion that you totally agree with the perspective that I'm giving here. And I look forward to you standing up and look forward to you speaking to it. I can tell you, you have the power you actually already have a legally established threshold that you could use as the bar to move all these programs up. And in so doing, you could lift all these other people up along with that. Largely, we're talking about seniors. Largely, we are talking about families who are working poor, who are working hard, who have little kids and are doing everything in their power to get by. And if you just lifted the threshold on some of these programs, you would do wonders for helping these people. And I recognize that when we stand on this side of the house and bring these issues forward, and it presents a contrary image to what you're doing, and those in government find it frustrating. 
But you have to remember, we're standing here on behalf of our constituents on stories that we're hearing. We're on the phone with these people. We're in meetings with these people and hearing their life stories. And we know that you all have the ability to do something about it, and you're choosing not to. Mr. Speaker, I could tell stories on behalf of my constituents for days, but I'm really interested in hearing what government has to say. So while there's still some time, I'm going to, uh, uh, we still have two minutes, I'm going to give government an opportunity to say what they'd like. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, uh, there's not much time left for anyone, but uh, anyway, I just had a number. If you imagine the $150 being offered to offset the inflation, which is 8.9 percent, what, what kind of income would that cover? And it turns out that number is uh, $1,685 a year. Uh, which I think is a very low income, way, way below any kind of limit. So uh, it is clearly not enough uh, if it's, uh, if you are in the income, if you are speaking about the uh, basket income, we were just talking about the number required to offset just the inflation, just to have the same money as you had before is about $3,000 a year. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to join debate. And uh, um, um, second by uh, the member from uh, Charlottetown, Belvedere. Debate's been adjourned. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty and the Third Party House Leader. Oh, sorry. sorry. The Honourable Member from Tignes Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move, seconded by the Leader of the uh, Third Party, that the 31st order of the day be now read. Shall carry. Order 31, an act to amend the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, Bill No. 125. The Honourable Member from Tignish, Pomeroy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I move, seconded by the Leader of the Third Party, that the said bill be now read a second time. Shall carry. carry. Bill No. 125, an act to amend the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, read a second time. The Honourable Member from Tignish, Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the Leader of the Third Party, that this House do now resolve himself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shall it carry? The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Winslow, to chair the Committee of the Whole House, please. The House is now in committee of the whole House to take into consideration a bill to be intituled an act to amend the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Is it the pleasure of the committee, uh, excuse me, hold on one second, we've already got our stranger on the floor, but for Hansard, could you please uh, use your uh, name and your title for Hansard? Sure, Joe Jeffrey, Clerk of the Legislative Assembly. Perfect, thank you. Um, there is only the one uh, clause, uh, but before we get into debate of this bill, we'll ask the promoter uh, if you have a brief statement uh, for this bill. I do, and thank you very much, Chair. 
Um, so the Standing Committee on Legislative Assemblies Management uh, met and they considered and approved amending uh, this act on April 26th. This was a result of request by the Ombudsperson uh, and it is supported by the Information of Privacy Commissioner as common practice right across this country. The bill adds the two newest statutory officers, the Child and Youth Advocate and the Ombudsperson, under the definitions of Officer of the Legislative Assembly in the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy. This, ensure, this ensures consistency as all other appointed officers of the Legislative Assembly are included in that definition. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Promoter. So I will open it up to the floor if there are any questions. Uh, sorry, Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Member, for bringing this in. Uh, I just want to ask a couple of pretty general questions. I'm supportive of this bill and the, the intent and what it's doing. Um, could you just let us know whether this brings us into line with other provinces or whether th this is something which is different? No, it does. It brings us into line with the majority of the provinces. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. And this was brought forward, we, we of course just established the office of the Ombudsperson here in Prince Edward Island. So it, was it in the establishment of that office that this gap was noticed? Yeah, so uh, the, uh, as you know, the Information Privacy Commissioner sent a letter indicating that um, it would have seen that it would have been the intent of the legislature to pass consequential amendments to the Information Privacy, uh, the uh, Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act to uh, include these two legislative officers in, so the Child and Youth Advocate and the information, or pardon me, the Child and Youth Advocate and the Ombudsperson in the definition of legislative officer, uh, but that wasn't done, and so it was identified by uh, the new ombudsperson that it wasn't in, and then when the Information Privacy Commissioner looked into the matter, she noticed also that the Child and Youth Advocate wasn't included. So. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks, Chair. And those offices have uh, expressed their, their support for this change. Absolutely. Yep. Leader of the Opposition. One final question. Um, does this bring all legislative offices then, under, uh, at this, put them all at the same standing? Yes. So any, the, the way the amendment is written, any officer of the Legislative Assembly that is appointed by the Legislative Assembly will be under the definition of officer of the Legislative Assembly, which is, seems pretty... Uh, that's an officer of the Legislative Assembly. <laughs> Leader of the Opposition. Clearest answer we've heard all day in here. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm good. Thank you, Chair. Are there any other questions? Shall the bill carry? Yeah. Carry. I move the title. An act to amend the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. I move the... Okay. Shall it carry? Carry. I move the enacting clause. Uh, be it enacted by the Lieutenant Governor and the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Prince Edward Island as follows. Shall it carry? Carry. Um, Mr. Or Mr. Chair, I move the Speaker take the chair and that the chair report the bill agreed to without amendment. <laughs> Shall it carry? Carry. You're welcome. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having had under consideration a bill to be intituled the act, an act to amend the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, I beg leave to report that the committee has gone through the said bill and has agreed to same without amendment. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Sure. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty and the Third Party House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This time I call motion 80. Shall I carry? Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Mr. Speaker, motion 80, targeted recruitment and retention strategy needed for long-term care. Uh, it's currently under debate, and the date debate was adjourned by the seconder, the Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty, third party house leader to resume debate. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a great pleasure to, to rise and, and pick up this motion uh, where we, where we kind of left off. And I think it's, we're all in agreement that there's uh, major issues with our health care system and uh, personnel has, has been identified by the minister as, as kind of uh, one of the biggest barriers. And I mean, we're all working together and we, 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 we ask a lot of questions on this, but I guess it's, it's our job on this side of the, the floor to say how, how, how crucial that is and how, how important that is and, and are we doing everything that we can to recruit and retain people, especially working in the long-term care sector of things. Um, now I know the, the minister, like since this was last debated, we've had some success, success stories. I mean, the, the government has uh, made it easier for RCWs to, to get educated, and I hear news that there's 200 people registered for the, the course in the, in, the, uh, in the fall or whatnot, and uh, don't quote my numbers there, Minister, because sometimes we, we can't quote yours. So anyway, but there's a lot of people signed up, and there's a lot of interest in that course, so there will be an influx of, of, of people coming out of that program, and, and you did, did the right thing by making it free, because we need that. And uh, I think uh, I, will, I support you on that. Here's the problem. At the same time, a day later or two days later, uh, the minister on the floor of the legislature says that we're closing 100 plus beds, long-term care beds, across, across the province. 60 public? I, I, was not, I was not ready for that, and, and 40 in the private sector. Those, those are beds that we need. So we've got an issue here where there's this big gap between, between recruitment and retention and issues that COVID affected us. We'll give you a break on that. We'll give you a break on what happened in COVID. But there was things that weren't done along the way that we needed to do because the issues around long-term care don't stop. And 100 beds taken out of the system, what that does is it, it f puts further strain on the QEH, the, the Prince County Hospital, all the great hospitals around, all the, the people who are working at where, where, do, where do people go when they should be taken care of like royalty at a time in their lives where, where they need us the most, they're not there because we had to shut the beds down, not because they weren't available, it was because there's nobody there to work them. There's nobody there. So here we are, and that's why this motion becomes important. So we're, we're looking at the future and more needs to be done, but the stress that our, our employees went under was too great for some, it was too much. And then we have, we've, we've, lost, we've lost nurses to, to other fields and other provinces and, and uh, federal government programs that, that were there. And you know we've got to make sure that we, we say, hey, long-term care is number one. So, because I look at it in the grand scheme of things, when a nurse comes out or a young person comes out, where do they want to go? Where do they want to go and, and work? I don't know if that person, if there's too many people that check off the number one and say, I want to go into long-term care right now. So we have to make that viable. We have to make that important and we have to provide better incentives for them to go, but also to retain them. And the, re the, the retention of people, especially nurses, RCWs, physiotherapists, everybody that works in those facilities becomes crucial. And here's a quote, respect is earned, honesty is appreciated, trust is gained, loyalty is returned. So the nurses, we're asking the nurses to provide loyalty, we're asking RCWs to provide loyalty, but where did, we, where did we go wrong on the other areas? Respect, honesty, trust. And we have to work on those three because they are giving it back, they're giving the loyalty back because they care about the people they've gone to work for. And we have to surround them with, with love and caring, whether it be whether it be valuing their jobs, whether it be a minister just showing up in the middle of the day with a birthday cake for somebody, I don't know what it is. Do things that they, they will remember. 
and they will talk about and they feel valued. And I've, I've had this conversation um, with the Premier. That's what we can do is retention and I'd be happy to help you with that. But I mean we need to retain, we need to retain people and say you know what I value working for Health PEI, I value the supports the Department of Health are giving us and this is a great island to work. I want to come to this island to be a health care provider. But it really does take a special person to work in long-term care. The patience, the respect, the compassion, the resiliency to go in every day is, is crucial. But there's also risk for them. And if you know when, when during the standing committee they, they talked about the, the workplace injuries that we, we also receive from from people working in the healthcare system. I'm bundled, over 300, Mr. Speaker. People every year get hurt. Those are professionals that get hurt because they might be doing, they might be doing something that requires two people. There's not two people around. I have to move this person on my own. I'm gonna get hurt. We can't, we can't do that. We have to make sure they're there for them. And workers' compensation, the numbers are there, and we have to get those down because they are not only valued, but they're experienced, and now we understand that they're incredibly hard to replace. So we have to look at those numbers and just make sure we're doing everything we can and talk to the, talk to the employees about how, how difficult it is to, to lift somebody, to roll somebody, to get them up for, for, um, for a meal or two. Those are the things that we have to look at and come to them and meet them in their workplace or where they are with their workplace and provide the necessary, just, just listen to their concerns and, and, and start to work on exactly what they need. And I think if we do that, it'll be a better place to work. I think it was around Remembrance Day. I, I, I had gone in and it was one of those times where you didn't know it was long-term care. You didn't know if you should be in there because of COVID. And um, I went into a ceremony and I just happened to be touring around a couple of the wings of PE Home. It wasn't long, Minister. It wasn't long. I'm at the friendliest RCWs, and you get that kind of look where they where they want to they want to talk and they want to let you know what it's like in there. And they they did. They 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 let me know, and it was uh, it was amazing because there wasn't anything that's going to sting the government. They just needed to be heard. They just wanted to know that somebody had to understand that they were working on their eighth day in a row because they didn't have a choice. They were working there diligently because there was nobody around them. We can't keep doing that to our staff. And, and I think with this motion, when you talk about recruitment, if that's our strategy where we're, we're going to do it, you've done something. You've done something, Minister. That's great. I uh, applaud you for that. But the retention is the hard thing. The retention is the most difficult thing where you say that I want people to come to the Prince Edward home and work in my district because it's the best place to work. It's the best environment to work. I don't know if we're there yet, but I think that's where we need to get, get to collectively. And I'll continue to listen and understand them um, when they are there. And you know, it's as simple as talking in those facilities, talking in those facilities to the volunteer coordinator. You know what's, you know what's very interesting? I'm talking to all Islanders here because the volunteer coordinators at these facilities are incredible. They, they, and they're, we're gonna need them over the next couple of years because uh, talking to them, I, I said, listen, can we run something in the district where members in District 14 can come in without training and help and help you do whatever it is they can? Because I know there's people on Lewis Point Drive and Parkside and, and Edmund Crescent that would give up their time to come in and help these facilities in need. So it might be, a if we get to that point, there are Islanders that will come and do whatever <laughs> they can to help. And if it comes to that stage, let's get that organized, Minister, and let's get that organized with the volunteer coordinators because when we had this discussion, that was something that gave them a boost. I don't, I don't care if it's, people wouldn't care if they're cleaning, I don't know, cleaning something. Put some, put some word in there. They don't care. They want to help out and we want to relieve the pressure that our great frontline workers are under. And I know we might have to work some paperwork through that, 
but I can tell you people will be motivated to get in there and help the people in long-term care facilities. But we need you to come to us to make sure, like, let's, let's get that happening where we can say, hey, let's open up those 100 beds across PEI, and if it's going to take a series of volunteer people, let's do it together. I mean, uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just giving ideas. I didn't research that idea before I decided to talk about it in the legislature. But I mean, there might be some hiccups along the way. But, yeah, yeah, don't let that stop it. But it's just some ideas. And it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of what we're saying is, let's start, let's start thinking differently about the issue if we have to go there, if we, if we have to make sure that we're, we're, um, we're doing everything we can. Next week is nurse, Nurses Week, Nurses Week on PEI, and I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a great time to celebrate the nurses that, that are there, the, the, the 62 plus nurses that came back during COVID that pretty much, you know, that, that, that saved a lot of people's lives during that time. And they came back, they worked diligently, and they worked long, hard hours. I mean, especially during the outbreaks in January, I remember talking to some nurses, they were in there, they were doing it, especially in the long-term care facilities. I heard this a few times, I can't leave. I can't leave this facility. I have to stay here, because I don't know if somebody's gonna be able to come back in. That's how desperate it was. And, and, and what we went through with COVID, we went through together. We, on this side of the house, we support a government for doing whatever they needed to do. Um, during that time, there wasn't, but, but, but then coming out of this, we knew there was going to be hiccups, and we have to be able to move diligently. Your department has to be able to move diligently, but we need the guidance coming from the top, coming from the top of Health PEI, coming from the Board of Health PEI, to make sure that we're doing a good job, especially with our long-term care facilities. So those are, those are a, couple, a couple things that we're, we're talking about, about retention and about recruitment. You did some th things, you've done some things with the Faculty of Nursing, we're watching closely, that's not enough, you can't stop. You can't stop with this because other provinces aren't stopping with this. We have to be creative, and I've heard it before, if Nova Scotia does this, PEI has to do this, we have to work together and we have to go after those nurses, international nurses, les infirmières qui parlent français, doivent venir ici à l'île du prince que ça c'est très important, le facilité comme chez nous, ça ne fonctionne pas maintenant parce qu'on ne parle pas ça. C'est incroyable. So we have to make sure that we speak French here. We want you here. We want you to come to Prince Edward Island. You have to get out there with that kind of energy. Maybe it's a little, the energy might be a little bit over the top, but you can, you can get out there with that kind of energy to say Prince Edward Island is a place that you want to call home. You want the world-class beaches, you come here. You want your families to be safe. You want to raise your families here, you come here and we're going to make sure we take care of you because we value you and we value the people that need the assistance for our healthcare system. So that's some of the, some of the that's, I, I hope you're feeling a little bit of excitement, Minister, because those are the things and the approaches that we have to take. Because we do have an aging population. Okay, our population, you look at the statistics, this is, this is uh, a full QEH. When is it gonna be not so full anymore? I, I, I don't know, because our population's aging, and the people and the baby boomers that help build our, our province during, during difficult times deserve the care that we have to be there to provide them with. And the numbers are gonna jump, okay? They're gonna jump pretty high. And our facilities, we don't just have to open up those 100 beds. We need, there's been numbers out there, we need another two, 250 beds just to be able to sustain the demand that's coming our way. So we can't play catch up just to get back to where we were. We have to keep going above and beyond. And uh, I think that, I think that with, with dedicated, with a dedicated approach and, and people doing things frontline, services in long-term care are exactly that. There is no, I remember in the speech from the throne, I talked to you, Minister, and I thought I saw a line that said, virtual long-term care. And I, 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 I saw it in there, and I'm pretty sure it's there. That's what the line said. And the first thing I said is, you can't provide long-term care really virtually. You can't do it. So I think I clarified it, but I think it might have been a typo. It might have been something coming from another line. But, and that's, that's, that's the difficulty, is that we need to be there for them. And when it works, Minister, when long-term care facilities work, they work so well. 
And I'll tell you, you can, you can go in to places like Garden Home at Christmas. You can go in, we'll get back to having the levees when Garden Home opens the door at the levees and they're, they're so excited to see you and they start, people start talking about their history and, and what they've been through and they're happy. Um, but we have to get back to that because COVID has really knocked that out of us. And we've got to make sure that we're there for them. And when people feel safe, go in there and, and do whatever you can in long-term care facilities. Volunteer, because the volunteer coordinators are there and they're ready to serve. So those are just you know a couple of my notes. So we're talking about things too as well. When you're talking about retention, professional development, professional development, you can do things with professional development that shows an entire organization that you care. You can do things that, that are very important. And you know, one of the things, Minister, when I'm, when I'm speaking to groups outside, when my former self, I would play this game, and you might be able to play this game with, with whatever. It's a conflict resolution game, and it finds out, it allows you to find out where the problems are. And it's called stop, start, and continue. Stop, start, and continue where you ask the nurses, you stand in front of the nurses as a minister and you say, what is something that myself as the minister can stop doing to make your life a little bit better? What's something that I need to stop doing as a minister? And you'll be surprised at the answers. What is something that I can start doing to be a better minister? And what is something that I'm doing well, what I need to continue doing as a minister? They might struggle with the last one, Minister, but <laughs> I'm just teasing. But it's, it's, it's a way, it's a listening game. It's a listening game. And it, it, you can do that with managers. Managers can do that with staff. It's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of neat being done with the facilitators because the amazing things that you'll hear, amazing things. And you know, where that, where that drill, I'll never forget it, where that drill worked the best when I was delivering speaking engagements was that the Q, QEH, had to do four sessions, and you think about, think about the people preparing the food at the QEH. There's, there's hundreds of them, and they're working so hard. But what kind of feedback do they get? What, what do we know about the work, the incredible work that they do, day in and day out? We have to make sure we, we remember everybody throughout the system whether they're work, whether, whether they're cleaning, whether they're the uh, doctor ahead of emergency, we have to listen more. We have to play that game. What can I do? What can I stop doing? What can I start doing? And what can I continue to do to make your life better? And that's what I kind of would like to remember during Nurses Week. We need to start uh, to listen to our professionals so that they can do a better job and feel better with their own quality of life and the quality of life that they're providing and the services that they're providing to our most vulnerable people at the in time in their life when they need it the most, when families are scared and, the, and then they're, they're there and they're ready to take on, be, be, be helped in that situation. So, and you look at different things, Minister, I want you to remember a few different things too, is just, just look at the provisional licenses, make sure that these facilities are up to, up to, up to code and we're, we're doing as best we can in the long-term care facilities. That helps, that helps with the recruitment and retention strategy. We have to make sure that the incentives are there, obviously, and that we're able to do whatever we can as taxpayers to provide the resources to their, our, our people to make sure that they're not only getting paid uh, accordingly, but they're valued. And the, the value piece is, is very important. We have to start taking care of our, of, of our, of our uh, facilities like the QEH. The QEH is stressed out because basically it's a long-term care facility in some of the places in there. And they're waiting to get in and the demand and the backup is there. It's not a, it's not a great place to, to spend some of the, the most, the times in your life where you, where you just want to spend it with family, you want to have a place to call home during this transition time. And we all remember, everybody in this legislature has somebody that's been affected by long-term care, mother or father. Um, you know when they get settled in, that feeling you get as a family member when you can put pictures up on the wall, when you, can, when you meet the nurse for the first time, when you meet the RCW that comes in with this energy 
at seven o'clock at night. It's turned down and they're just super excited that it's a turned down facility and services. That's the type of person, that's the type of facility we need to do. We need to take away the barriers and look inside to make our, our long-term care facilities as best they can. And this is, this is an incredible opportunity for you, Minister, as you're three years in. And, and, and everybody, I hope you get support from all your ministers around because it, it's, it's something that our society needs. Um, and it, it's necessarily not, not your fault all the time, Minister, even though we try to let you know that COVID was a major wrench, but we do have to keep you accountable. And we will keep driving you to do more because we know you can do it. And it's important for uh, the people in, in Prince Edward Island. So I hope this helps uh, just give you a little bit of understanding. I tried to make it positive, very important on, on this side, recruitment, but retention, there's a few ideas there, but it's our, it's our future, it's, it's for our, our families, and when you help one person, you help an entire family um, get relaxed and, and, and take comfort in knowing that their loved one and the things that they've done are going to be remembered and they're going to be safe and this is the place to do it. So, uh, merci beaucoup pour uh, le temps, tout le monde. Viens ici à l'île du Prince Edouard si tu es uh, infirmière ou quelque chose comme ça, une autre profession. And uh, thank you for your time and thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'll be right up front. I'm not sure. Uh, just uh, the enthusiasm from Charlottetown West Royalty, it's contagious. It really is. And I appreciate that from him. And I appreciate his positive, uh, his positive tone. And I, you know, I, I fully realize that uh, it is uh, the job, in this case, uh, the responsibility of the third party. Uh, both uh, the mover of, uh, of the motion from Larry Inverness and the seconder as well, but to hold government to account. I do appreciate that. But I also appreciate when news comments come forward, such as from Charlottetown Restaurant, and the, the positive message, the encouragement from the honorable member, uh, it is uh, it's a breath of fresh air, is what it is. Uh, now, uh, before I get into some of the notes here, you know, and some of the suggestions that the honorable member did put forward, uh, and uh, I was reflecting, as I had uh, indicated here earlier today, that I was at uh, the AGM uh, for the PEI Nurses Union this morning. And I'll be honest, uh, Mr. Speaker, I had not heard about the game Stop, Start, and Continue previously. Uh, and maybe it's just as good, because if I had started that game this morning, I might still be up in Somerset, to be honest. But, uh, but with that, and not only to, uh, to pay accolades or give accolades uh, to the uh, member from Charlottetown, West Royalty, but also to the mover of, uh, of motion uh, from Larry Inverness. I know we'll have our back and forths in here, and uh, which we should in question period, which we absolutely should. But I know I've known uh, the mover of the motion for a lot of years. I know uh, he had challenges in health care, and he dealt with them. He worked hard, I know he did, to overcome them. And there always have been, and uh, we'll, you know, we'll do our best to overcome them to the extent that we can. And uh, I appreciate the conversations that, that the honorable member has had with me, just, you know, in general terms, but also how things, how we might be able to potentially work together as well. So, do appreciate that. The member from uh, Charlottetown, West Royalty, and I do believe uh, uh, the mover of the motion from Larry Inverness, both alluded to the fact that so many of us in here have either presently or have had loved ones in long-term care. I'm in that boat. Um, and the member from, uh, from Charlottetown, West Royalty, 
you're absolutely right. The enthusiasm that the workers have there, the care that they show for, and I'll never cut, long-term care, it's not patients, it's residents, because that is their home. That is absolutely their home. The member alluded to uh, things like having the family pictures up on the wall, going in at 7 o'clock for turndown. But with that, the residents aren't always quite ready at 7 o'clock <laughs> for turndown. Nor should they have to be, in my opinion. Should they have to be? If they, okay, if there's a Leafs game on tonight, I'm not going to put a whammy on it like the leader of the opposition oh. did on the Raptors here a while ago. So all I'm going to say is there's a Leafs game on tonight. <laughs> so if you're a resident in one of our LTC facilities and you want to stay up and watch, and I don't care whether you're uh, going for the Lightning or you're going for the Leafs, but if you want to stay up and you want to watch that game, I challenge anybody to tell me why they should not be able to. No whammies, I said. Hey, come on, come on. But, uh, you know, with that, it's, yeah. Well, I won't mention the Bruins. We'll, we'll leave that uh, as an aside. But, uh, yes, there's challenges uh, we're fair to do. And I do thank, again, both uh, the mover and the seconder for bringing this forward. Uh, certainly staff in long-term care right across the province, they have worked diligently day and night throughout the pandemic to ensure that Islanders, Island seniors are well cared for and that they are well supported. And I think back prior to the pandemic, when I would go into long-term care facilities and visit residents in there, visit loved ones in there, and saw how well they were cared for. And then we hit that time, March of 2020, and things got locked down. So those workers, the nurses, the LPNs, the RCWs, they at that point in time they had to take on an additional role. And that additional role that they had to take on, in addition to the service, the care that they had been providing previously, was they became even closer to being the family member there. You know, and the ones uh, are residents in long-term care. I know from personal experience and I know from speaking to a lot of uh, family <clears throat> members of other residents in long-term care. It was difficult for them to understand, to appreciate, to be able to grasp how come my son, my daughter, my husband, my loved one had been coming in day after day after day, giving me a hug, bringing in treats for me, and then bam. All I can do is see them through the window or a door. And it was for their protection. We took the advice and will continue to take the advice, as I've seen so many times, from the experts. But with that, those residents, they could not grasp that, nor could we expect them to grasp that. So that became an additional role that was taken on from the RCWs, from the LPNs, from the nurses that I have spoke with, that was taken on gladly, knowing the situation that everybody was dealing with. So uh, I just want to, uh, to point that out, uh, Mr. Speaker, that importance of that loving, caring relationship that our frontline health care staff, right across the board, but certainly in our long-term care facilities have provided. And Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty alluded to some of the initiatives that have been taken. And uh, certainly uh, I do believe that since this motion was brought forward 
initially, that there has been initiatives taken. The covering of tuition costs is uh, the one certainly that is front and center, I'm sure, in the honorable <coughs> member's uh, uh, mind, and certainly in mine as well. But those are the types of initiatives that we do. We always have to be open to looking at new ideas. Uh, and we're not exclusive to those ideas on this side of the house. I think everybody in here, we may not always agree if that idea is the one that we should be pursuing, but we have to be open to looking at it. Now, the honorable member had mentioned uh, virtual long-term care. So I'm not sure, uh, I'd have to say yes, that's, uh, that's probably a concept that I would have a little bit of challenge getting my head around. But with that, so are there, and uh, uh, I've had questions with regard to uh, the delivery of virtual health care services here before. But we always have to be open to new ideas, new initiatives, that first and foremost are going to make it better for our loved ones, for Islanders, but secondly, and very close to the same level of importance, is to provide assistance, to provide help, to make the day-to-day -day life of our frontline health care providers, even if it's just a little bit easier, but to make it that, that, uh, that improvement or a bit easier. But again, going back to, uh, you know, some of uh, the incentives and initiatives, and I agree 100% with the mover and the seconder, that yes, recruitment, that is vital, <coughs> completely vital. We cannot stop our efforts with regard to recruitment, whether it's RCWs, LPNs, nurses, nurse practitioners, doctors, specialists. But if we drop the ball on retention, then is it for naught? That is, uh, I think, a very valid question. And it is a fact that, yes, we have to have emphasis on both recruitment, but also on retention. Uh, I had mentioned, uh, Mr. Speaker, covering of the tuition cost for RCWs, the seed expansion at Holland College, for LPNs and RCWs, Mr. Speaker. The RN bridging program, physicians, uh, the family doctor's incentives, the anesthesia, psychiatrist incentives, uh, specialist, and also the up to a certain number of dollars for moving expenses. The fact, and to me, it speaks volumes, the fact that we put into place an incentive for psychologists not that many months ago. And it showed results. It showed rapid results. So that speaks to me of the importance of providing those incentives. But those incentives are with regard to recruitment. Absolutely. Um, retention, we have to be open. We have to, I as minister, we as a government, have to be open and to listen to our frontline health care providers. And I know it's easy for me to stand here and say that and uh, go on, but I am sincere on that. Sometimes some of these things do not happen just like that. As much as I may want to see them or would like to see them happen in the blink of an eye, uh, I know that uh, the leader of the third party really appreciated my comment yesterday at one point in time with regard to that phrase, taking the bull by the horns. He's mentioned that to me two or three times uh, uh, since yesterday. But it is, it's, a, it's an analogy that we have to do the hard work. We have to do the things that, you know, aren't always the easiest that may take some time, and I guess to follow up on that uh, to the leader of uh, the third party, it may take some time to get that ball wrestled to the ground, but you have to have the commitment to do that. It's the long and the short of it. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there may be other ones here. I would love to see this motion come to a vote here. 
this afternoon. I certainly fully uh, support the intent of the motion. I do want to work with uh, the mover and the seconder. Some of the things that uh, the seconder of the motion did bring forward this afternoon in in COVID times, I'll be completely frank, it very well could be a real challenge to take those forward right now when we look at the restrictions that are in place in our long-term care facilities, both uh, public and private. But having said that, you know, we are going to get beyond this point. When we are going to get beyond it, I don't know if any of us, uh, I don't think, I know none of us could stand here and say that on December 12th of 2022, it's going to be all over. I wish we could. No, oh, I wish we could, but you, you hear like this, what I'm saying, with regard, and I'm speaking specifically, with regard to the pandemic, with regard to the implications uh, and the, the restrictions that it has placed and will continue to place uh, on, uh, on our most vulnerable and on our uh, frontline uh, healthcare staff, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. But again, like I said, I do, I do want to see this get to a vote. I do appreciate it bring, being brought forward and appreciate too, certainly uh, from both the mover and the seconder, but uh, uh, the enthusiasm that was exuded there by Charlottetown West Royalty and uh, the suggestions, as always. And we've had the discussion uh, before as well with regard to organ and tissue donation, with regard to wellness, and just the enthusiasm that the member does show in the suggestions and the ability and the willingness to work together collaboratively in partnership, outside of question period maybe, but, uh, but to work together as we move forward in some of these. Uh, so Mr. Speaker, I have a number of pages of notes here that uh, I have uh, certainly not adhered to in any way, shape, or form. But uh, I just to briefly recap, there have been strides, there have been successes made with regard to retention, and uh, certainly with regard to recruitment, we do have a, excuse me, we do have a ways to go here, but uh, I think by working together as much as possible, that uh, but we can make improvements, that we can reach the goals, that we collectively, everybody, every islander, not just the ones in this legislative assembly, but every islander wants us to meet and that we do have to meet. So with that, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'll, I'll just start off by mentioning the phrase that the Minister of Health used. You know, with 285 uh, RNs able to retire, you may want to take the bull by the horns and uh, try to get something done before the end of the year. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go more positive. I can't be as quite as energetic as my honorable member to my right. But he's, he's getting me there. He's getting me there. But as, as the minister said, and as was said here today, we all felt sadness when things shut down. We all didn't get to see loved ones. I had an uncle that was in long-term care before the pandemic, but I got to see what happens inside there, going to see him, the smile on his face. He loved it there. The RCWs, the RNs, the LPNs, all the staff, like, they're just terrific in these facilities. You know, I miss going to the Chinoo, the Chinoo. I miss going to the units in Summerside during the pandemic. It's, it's something we lost. And when you see some of these people's families, you ask them how their loved ones are doing, and, and they say, you know, they're getting along well, but it was, it was quite, a, quite an ordeal. They didn't get to see them as often as, as the minister said, you know, saying hi through the window, or, or two people could go, or three people could go, but the other five family members couldn't go. It was hard on everybody. But I, I can't say enough about the staff 
And I do want to commend the minister. You know, I know it took some pushing from the honorable member from Malaria and Vanessa to bring up the RCW situation over and over, but it was nice to see you take that. And, you know, outside of question period, we'd be glad to work together to try to alleviate this problem because this is something that affects all of us. We've all either had a loved one or a family, friend, or some elder that's been in these seniors' homes. And I mean, these, as has been said, you know, they're not patients, they're residents. And, you know, they, they love to see us. They love to watch a hockey game. If we can go in and play a game of cards with them, there's no pressure, there's no you have to leave. You know, you could stay, well, you can't stay till 2 in the morning, but you could stay past 7 p.m. And I mean, we all miss that. I, I, I just can't say it enough, you know, if there's 103 beds that are empty and the hospital's being backed up, I know that's not a fix as the minister would like that. That doesn't get fixed right away. But we need to all work at that. And, you know, if we all know someone that's wanting to come to our lovely province or someone that's graduating, we need to encourage them to come here, all of us, not just your recruitment team. We all need to do that together. And, I mean, we can't say enough about what we need to do. The pandemic has really been something. We had a, and, and I get goosebumps to say this, you know, at Le Chenou, we had a fire. The staff were phenomenal. The fire department was phenomenal to get everybody out safe. They went to Mill River. All that was phenomenal. They went to Andrews from there. They went to Tignish. They went to Alberton. Everybody pulled together, and it goes to show what we can do when something serious happens here in this province and what a wonderful people we are. And I met one of the seniors that moved back to the Chinoo and they said, gee, we haven't seen you for a while. And I said to them, I said, I, I, I haven't gone because for fear of, I don't want to bring COVID in there and I don't want to leave with COVID and there's restrictions. I don't have a loved one in there. You're just, you're my friends. And oh, okay, we understand that. And, and it was tough because you get used to doing that. I used to go there at least once every two weeks, just drop in and say hello and talk to the staff and see the residents that I had a close connection with. And you, we all lost that. And it was quite something. So I guess I have a, not quite a minute left, so I'd like to adjourn debate at this time. Seconded by Donald Mayor from Shelltown, West Road. Shell Carey. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that the first order of the day be now read. Shirley Carey. Carey. Order number one, consideration of the supplementary estimates in committee. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure that this House do now resolve itself into committee the whole House to take into consideration the said bill. Shirley Carey. Carey. The Honourable Member from Tignish Palmer Rope, Deputy Speaker, Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please.
The House is now in a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supply to Her Majesty. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Yeah. So, honourable members, we're doing the supplementary estimates, and we will begin on page seven. Schedule A, page seven. Would you please state your name and position for Hansard? Uh, Gordon McFadgen, Assistant Secretary of Treasury Board. Thank you very much, Gordon, and welcome. So again, honourable members, we are on page seven, Schedule A, 2021-2022, Supplementary Estimates Number Two, Summary of Special Warrants, Agriculture and Land Capital, 26,500. Shall the section carry? Here. Education and Lifelong Learning Capital. 13,270, 13,270,000. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, just a quick question on this. Was any of the funding for capital improvements in this section for school ventilation? Uh, not, not for this particular year. Those projects were just started in the, the summer of 2021. So okay. they're coming, if, if they are over budget, it'll be coming up in another, right. another time period. Charlottetown Belvedere. And I appreciate cl that clarification because these are the warrants that have been extended to cover the overrun cost cost overrun. Is that correct on previous capital projects? Um, this particular schedule is dealing with uh, funds during. It is during the current fiscal year 21-22, uh, so there are no past fiscal years within this schedule. Um, but those particular projects just, like I said, just started this summer, so we're, we're kind of we're still working through uh, the process on, on those particular projects. Cheryl Town over there. Um, and I noticed that there's a cost offset for the, the um, electric school buses from the federal government. Um, are, we, are we getting those buses in a timely manner? I heard there had been a delay. So we've paid up front, but have all the buses arrived? Um, I'm unsure of the exact delivery schedule for the buses, but uh, I know that the, the Department of uh, Education and Lifelong Learning tries to uh, run the procurement in a timely manner so that they arrive in time for the September start of the school year. Now, we do receive some over the summer months when they're kind of getting in service and ready to go, but uh, they're, they're always working hard to make sure they're there for September. Charlottetown Belvedere. That's it. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Sure. Transportation and infrastructure. Capital. 3,330,700. Shall the section carry? Sure. Oh, Larry Inverness. What's the plans for that building? I mean, you're not going to be using it, hopefully, fairly soon. Uh, is there a, an intentional use for this building to do something else? Three million dollars, a lot of money for a short um, period of time. Yeah, no. It, well, it wasn't three million for those particular structures. That was part of. Oh, part this of is just for the land. Pardon? <laughs> this is just for the land. No, there's land. Um, we bought some land. We did put the structures up, and as well, we did some additional um, bridge work and bought some heavy fleet as well. Oh, Larry Inverness? Yeah, so, uh, but is there an, a plan beyond this for the building uh, that it could be retrofitted down the road or, or whatever to get some value of it back? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't know exactly what they're going to be doing. The, the units that were purchased out there were purchased from, I believe, a company in Slemon Park. They were partially uh, finished, so they weren't kind of quite finished, so they were good for the purpose for just sheltering people, but uh, would need additional work to be habitable, but um, I'm sure that the, the department will be looking at repurposing those um, particular units. Well, Larry Inverness? Uh, I guess that's fine, thanks. Shall the section carry? Sure. Agriculture and land, 10,200,000. Charlottetown Belvedere? Uh, that of federal dollars for these expenditures, because this is for the potato, water, the potato destruction plan of the 2021 crop? And I understand there was supposed to be federal money. Yes. This was the provincial portion okay. of the program. Uh, the federal portion um, was was upwards of about 15 million. So okay. they dealt directly with the farmers as well, and uh -huh. we dealt directly with farmers for okay. our portion. Of it. So it's a direct contribution rather than something that's then going to be offset. Correct. They didn't okay. flow the money through us um, for this particular program. That's it, thank you. Okay, shall the section carry? Sure. Agriculture and land, 1,629,000. Oh, 
Oh, Larry Inverness? So this for the mental health uh, issues, or is this more for the trip to Washington? Or what's this? I was coming. I think these questions were answered yesterday when you brought them up. This is the exact same money that you were kind of talking about yesterday. Yeah. Oh, everybody's watching, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> One of the 25. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have. A, I think the breakdown was provided yesterday. Definitely, the the outreach was part of it. Uh, the biggest part of, of this was uh, the dehydration program that they were running right, through, uh, through Surrey West there. Oh, Irene Vernes. Ah, that's good. Thanks. Shall the section carry? Carry. Economic growth, tourism, and culture: five million five hundred seventy thousand five hundred. Shall the section carry? Carry. carry. Tourism PEI, 1,286,400. Charlotte Belvedere? Um, why do we need an extra 1.2 million to advertise golf courses and parks? <laughs> um, the majority of, of the, um, the costs here, um, tourism PEI and particularly golf PEI and, and parks as well, are revenue and expenditure related yes so the more business that you have the more kind of cost of goods sold you have yes. so there were additional staff required there was additional um, materials required as well to generate the extra revenue for the golf courses so we would have a set budget but as revenues grew some expenses grow as well and so the spe mm -hmm. special work is required and, and was that a successful outcome Yes, that was a successful outcome. I believe they, they had a, a very successful golf season. Booming um, year. Is so an investment worth making then? Well, yeah, it is sort of, you know, it's the way the expenses go. If you have more revenue, sometimes you need additional expenses as well. Understood. Thank you. Okay, Charlotte Elmas So are we going to, I was going to ask a similar question to, I just didn't understand the word of additional marketing uh, for cost. What happens next year? Well, they would have had some estimates on where they think they will be for this year as well. But again, they were formulated in, in February when we really weren't sure where we would be at this point in time again. So if there is another exceptionally successful year, I expect they may be back for a special warrant if indeed uh, the bookings come, come to fruition. Charles, that was royalty. Okay, and then at what point are we going to see that reflected in the budget rather than in special warrants? <laughs> yeah, well, the budget's a, kind of a point in time determining what the cost would be for the upcoming year, and uh, these special warrants would be the reflection of revised spending requirements authorized by the legislature um, when when they're required. Charles, that was royalty. If 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 we're having a special warrant here, why are why are golfers playing more money, I guess, is what I would be asking, because that's what I'm hearing from people. <laughs> Again, in, in, in the marketplace, you know, they're trying to be, um, develop a, a, and provide a product that, uh, that people will pay for, so it's like a supply and demand thing. Yeah. Charlotte, how much royalty? That's good for me, thanks. Shall the section carry? Yes, Educational and lifelong learning, 9,920,000. Shall the section carry? Yes, Executive Council, 450,000. Shall it carry? Yeah. General government, 25 million. Shall it carry? Yeah. Health and wellness, 5,869,000. Shall it carry? Yeah. Social development and housing, 11,049,200. Shall it carry? Yeah. Total special warrants, 87,601,300. Shall it carry? Yeah. Um, shall the uh, supplementary estimates carry? Yeah. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair make a report to Mr. Speaker. Shall I carry?
Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, I wish to report that the Committee has gone into supplementary supply to be granted to Her Majesty and has come to certain resolutions thereon. Which said resolutions I am directed to report to the House whenever it should be pleased to receive same. Shall carry. 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 The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that the report of the Committee be now received. Shall carry. carry. Mr. Speaker, I move that the report of the Committee be now adopted. Shall carry. carry. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that the 19th order of the day be now read. Should it carry? carry. Order number 19, an act to amend the Climate Leadership Act, Bill number 60, pardon me, Bill number 60, ordered for second reading. Should it carry? carry. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the Honourable Premier that this House do now resolve itself in a committee of whole house. Sir. The Honourable Minister of Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have been listening to the Premier's explanation on carbon tax and carbon tax related things since 2019. And I must say, it is quite cathartic to have the opportunity to speak to the principal of this. <laughs> oh, We're not there yet? Not there yet. My apologies, then, Clerk. Do I have a Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We'll get this right. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I move, uh, second by the Premier, that the bill be read a second time. Shall it carry? Mr. Speaker, debate was uh, adjourned by the Honourable <coughs> Premier on the motion to read this bill a second time. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, while I know there are many who would like to hear me talk more about this, Mr. Speaker, uh, I've concluded my remarks and I would uh, cede the floor to the next speaker. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to this motion? No? The Honourable Minister of uh, the Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know you're all shocked that I want to speak to this. I think I've kept that a secret very well, Mr. Speaker. I must say, it is my great pleasure to have an opportunity to speak to this. I have listened to explanations from this party on carbon tax and carbon tax related things for years. And I will tell you, it is cathartic to have the opportunity to address and unpack some of those things today. I believe, Mr. Speaker, that one of the most dangerous things that politicians do is speak with absolute conviction on things they don't know well. It is that banking on being able to spread a message and have people believe it, whether or not it's correct, that has held up progress on issues like climate change and environmental issues and women's issues for decades. This, this banking on being able to get a simple message to stick has been problematic and is a source of major frustration for me. The Premier said when he was speaking about a month ago, the last time this was on the floor, that he knows retail politics and <laughs> agree. I would say anyone who was listening to what was said during the 2019 leaders debate would understand that well. I fundamentally disagree with government's plan on how to address carbon tax. I fundamentally disagree with it, and I believe that this House should have a conversation about what other options could look like. And I know we have a tendency to come to the House and have these discussions as if the outcomes are a foregone conclusion, particularly now that government has a majority, but that's actually not the case. I do understand that there's a certain degree that cabinet solidarity means that ministers do actually need to toe the line to some degree. You know, you make a decision, you have an opportunity behind the scenes to say what you want to say, but then when you reach the floor, ministers do have a certain degree of obligation to go with the decision. But that's not true for all of you. So assuming that the third party has decided to side with islanders on this, um, what is actually best for islanders, then the people who are going to make the decision on whether or not we choose this plan or a different plan are the four backbench members. So 
I would power. encourage you to follow this debate with interest because <laughs> despite the fact that we come to this house every day as if every decision made is a foregone conclusion now that you've got a majority, <laughs> if the four of you believe this is the best plan, by all means get on the list and stand up and tell this house why because your constituents are watching. And if you believe that this is the best outcome for your constituents, I am here for it. Let me hear your thoughts on that and be on the record. So when your constituents come back and say, hey, was this the best plan for us? You will be on the record for why. Government members actually probably have an easier out than the rest of you because cabinet solidarity says they should vote with government. That's not true for you. The function of this house is to hold government to account and backbench, that's you. I'm going to pretend that the arguments I make in this house are worthy of consideration by all of you. I'm going to pretend I believe you think that. And that if I make a compelling case, you should be willing to at least consider it. So I fundamentally disagree that this is the best plan for us to move forward. And I'll tell you why. If I could look at climate change in isolation as if nothing else existed, I would agree with government. Mm -hmm. I would say take that money and invest it into infrastructure that allows for a rapid transition, do that. That's what I would say. But here's the thing, long before now, we've been aware that islanders are struggling. In fact, like some islanders don't have a choice was government's mantra in the 2019 election when you were all waxing poetically about the infamous driver who had to head from Tignish to Charlottetown every day and didn't have another choice. That was the whole argument when you were all saying the carbon tax was the devil and it was the worst case scenario and if you got elected you'd never bring in carbon tax retail politics indeed. But here we are. We recognize, we recognize some people don't have a choice and some people are struggling. So this is why I genuinely believe that we need to consider whether or not this is the best pathway forward. So let's consider what we're talking about here. We say if we don't bring in this plan, we will be forced to have the federal backstop. And woo, that sounds scary because who wants the federal backstop? And that's, that's a really persuasive argument. Until you unpack that for a second, because like what the federal backstop is, is the $31 million we collect goes back out to Islanders. Under the government's plan, $8 million goes back out to Islanders. I gotta tell you, that sounds less scary to me. So if someone can explain to me why that's a terrible deal for Islanders, I am here for it. Stand up in this house and explain for backbench members who are the decision makers on this, why that's a better decision. For Islanders, if you feel like it is, I would love to hear that. If someone can explain that to me, you can change my mind on what we should do. But as far as I can tell, $31 million going back out to Islanders is probably a better deal. So we've heard, we've heard a few talking points tested out for why we shouldn't do this. One is that we're advocating for the far right plan of the Jason Kenney conservatives as if the liberal backstop was the plan of the far right conservatives. <laughs> that, that, that doesn't even make any sense. If Adam <laughs> Ross is the one who wrote that line, like let him get some sleep. Because that, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, Premier, and you know it doesn't. Their plan, their plan was 100, oh is that low? It is low. It's, totally low. it's low, that's fascinating. Totally low. Oh, so. Stand in this house or sit in this house, totally low. Okay. Please, continue. Move. No. You had the floor. Thank Remember? you. I'll tell you, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to say that the plan that the conservatives fought against vehemently was their plan. So the federal liberal backstop is the far right conservative plan. Their plan was to win their charter challenge against carbon tax, which they lost. And for anyone who thinks we don't remember, the Attorney General signed on for intervener status in that charter challenge. So we know, we know that this is not, anyone who wants to correct me on whether or not the Attorney General signed on for intervener status on the charter challenge is free to table that, but we've had that in question period before and this has already been discussed. You withdrew your status, but you did apply for it. 
You can shake your head. Feel free to table it. So here we are. We've got a plan that was put forward by the federal liberals that is not a far right plan that says we will take that money and we will give it back to islanders. And here is the other argument that we hear. If you give the money back to people, how does that help climate change? And again, that sounds really persuasive until you unpack that for a couple of minutes. A lot of these arguments, again, Mr. Speaker, sound really persuasive until you have an opportunity to run the math on it. We've had Nobel Prize winners who were economists who put forward this plan and have said this is a better deal for people and it's effective. So this isn't my opinion. I have a lot of data to back this up. If you are looking at an office building that doesn't have enough parking and they need to find a way to encourage people to not fill up the parking lot, let's say you implement this tax on everyone who uses the parking lot, you have to pay a fee. And at the end of the month, that money gets divvied out and everybody gets some of it back. And if you have another choice, you might choose to take the bus, you might choose to walk, you might choose to hop on your bike, you might choose to carpool. But if you are driving from Tignish to Charlottetown and you just don't have another choice, so be it. The people who don't have another choice will get the money back at the end. The people who do have another choice will take that other choice and they still get the money either way. So I've got an incentive to do this. There are lots of examples of why this fee and dividend, if you will, model where you take the money and then you give it back is a good incentive because people who have a choice will take it and people who don't are not impacted. So I'll circle back on what I was saying. If I could look at climate change as if it existed in isolation, Premier, I would support this plan because I think it is important to invest in this kind of infrastructure. But what I can tell you unequivocally is even before the cost of living started to skyrocket, people were struggling. Islanders were struggling. Seniors were struggling. Premier, you used an example, I believe that was your father, who would not have been able to take that money and invest in a heat pump, for example, and I empath empathize with that. And I would say, Premier, that your father was an example of someone who shouldn't have had to go first anyway. Because when we're talking about climate change, a really fundamental component of that is climate justice. And that means some people have more privilege and more ability than others. And the people with the least means don't have to go first. The people who don't own houses, who can't be buying heat pumps, they're not the people we are expecting to go first. They are not. The people we need to make changes are people who do have a choice to change. And that's what this plan leaves out, which is why I fundamentally disagree with this as a strategy. The Premier, when he was speaking in his remarks about this a month ago, was saying that this is the wrong place for us to be having this debate. But I disagree on that, too, because the premise of this is we're asking the House to approve the collection of this revenue going to government. And I don't think you should give them that power. Because here's the thing. I believe that the federal backstop would be better for your constituents. And I think you do, too. If you don't think that the federal backstop, that getting $800 versus getting $150 is better for your constituents, please explain that to me. I am all ears. But if you do think that what would be better for them is the federal backstop, then you should not hand over this power to government. You should allow the federal backstop to come into effect. You should allow government to go back to the negotiating table and come back with a better plan. This government has ridiculed the former liberal plan, which gave back free driver's licenses, as a terrible plan and like look agree it was a terrible plan <laughs> it was, it was a terrible plan. but this guy
government's plan is to give back the value of a driver's license, which is equally terrible. Like, equally terrible. You're not in a position to throw a lot of stones when this is what you've had, like, three years, and this is what you're coming back with. So, so, I am going to propose that this House has a choice. I concede, ministers, you probably don't have a choice. You've had your conversations behind the scenes. And cabinet solidarity means that you've had those conversations and you've said what you think behind the scenes, but when you come to the House, so be it. And I, I give you all that. I do. I understand. But assuming that Liberals intend to side with Islanders on this, and I'm, I'm assuming that you likely do, there are four people in this House whose constituents are watching and who elected you to represent them. And your job is to hold government to account. So I want to know if the four of you legitimately believe that this is better for your constituents or better for climate change. I fail to see how, but I'm really open-minded to that. If you've put together a plan that puts Nobel Prize winning economists to shame, tell me all about it. I'm all ears. I have changed my mind on this in the past. I did believe that carbon tax money should be collected and invested into infrastructure. I did, until I started having conversations with people about what their lives look like in real life. And what their lives look like in real life is they don't have expense accounts. People are struggling. And climate justice says those who are struggling the most aren't the ones who have to go first. Yeah. So I will keep my remarks relatively short, Mr. Speaker. I obviously wanted to discuss this, but I also am very interested in listening. So if someone has a compelling argument for why this is better, I am really open to it because I recognize that your majority government might be really fun right now, but when your constituents come to you when this house rises in a few more days and said, hey, you're here to represent me, you're going to have to have a better answer than, well, we had the votes to carry it, so we did. You're going to have to have something that you can come back to them with. And I would love to know what that's going to be. So I will conclude my remarks, Mr. Speaker, and I'll look forward to hearing from those who are actually going to make this decision on how this is in their constituents' best interest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Larry Inverness, Third Party Whip. Oh, gee, great, Mr. Speaker. I've been sort of hanging in here for quite a while on this one, and I appreciate some of the comments that have been made in this. I do think this is an, <coughs> an extremely important bill to debate. And I have to say I am disappointed that the government doesn't seem to be wanting to do. The Premier made a few comments on it, and that was appreciated, at least to give some sense of uh, where his view is are on it. But, I mean, I would hope that this is an opportunity. This is a significant decision that we make in this province. I was part of a government that made decisions somewhat similar of that nature, Mr. Speaker. And yes, we were criticized. We did take it on the chin for some of the decisions that we made regarding this. I've always said to myself that I'm a, I am a supporter of a carbon levy, some form that, uh, that determines what a price is on carbon. Uh, I've said many times, even during the last election campaign, when lots of people were asking me, I used to try to explain a little bit. You have to remember that there was a meeting that was occurred in this world, and it was called the, the Paris Accord. The world got together. It made a decision on putting a price on carbon. I think there was maybe two countries that were the exception to that. And, uh, you know, I'll have to assume that the right experts were there and said that this was the best way to determine and how we can do uh, to reduce our carbon in, in, uh, uh, footprint to make sure that we can deal with what's out there, climate change. I don't think anybody, or at least very few in here, would be deniers of climate change. There's certainly lots of uh, uh, people out there that uh, are in that category, Mr. Speaker. But I think, you know, I think we've seen it with Hurricane Dorian. I've seen it on my own property, my own farm, uh, how extremes seem to be occurring. We've seen it in droughts. We've seen it to too much rain. We've seen it to too much snow, not enough snow. Uh, the list goes on in that, Mr. Speaker. 
And uh, so generally, you know, I tend to support that concept, Mr. Speaker, that we do have to put a price on it. We do have to uh, figure out what that price is. And I think uh, the country of Canada has uh, implemented that. But the reality is, Mr. Speaker, and why I struggle with this particular bill and, and the check plan here, I, I feel we got a bad deal. That's the part that I struggle with, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, when we look at provinces across the country that have had choices on how they implement this, we've got the lowest amount of rebate that goes back to people that are affected by this by a lot. As I recall, I think the next lowest is Quebec at $500. And, uh, you know, some are a thousand, some are, are, you know, different numbers. And I know those numbers are going to change as we move forward. But this $140, Mr. Speaker, it doesn't, it, it wouldn't buy a tank of gas for people. I filled up my vehicle, my 2012 terrain, which I've m made uh, famous in this legislature. It was 142 yesterday to fill it up. You know, and I'm told gas is going up again, likely in the near future. Not, I don't know what day or anything. But, you know, I just look at myself as a person who has to drive to Charlottetown to work. Uh, you know, it was $50 for quite some time. Now it's $70 to come to Charlottetown and back each day. And uh, I, I know we are probably a little more privileged for when we come sit in the legislature. I do get mileage. Uh, but when I, I mentioned in this legislature a few times before about an individual, I called him Danny, the, the individual that had cataracts and four times he had to go to Charlottetown to try to get his assessment done uh, on his cataract surgery. And then I asked the Minister of Social Services, how much do you get <laughs> to uh, compensate Danny to come to his trip? $40. He can't get anybody to take him for that. You know, and the, the government's response. Well, he can go take Tooney Transit. I get a call from, you know, uh, Mike Cassidy about, oh, I'd like to help Danny. And I'm sure he would. I, and I appreciate that. But when you're going for cataract surgery, <laughs> you know, uh, getting on a bus and about four or five stops along the way and the list goes on of problems, that's not going to cut it, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, a person like Danny is going to be impacted by this. And, uh, you know, so we have to do what we can to make sure that we're getting a fair deal for Islanders, a fair deal for the people that were impacted. So once again, as, a, as an MLA who likes to uh, get feedback from my constituency, and I ask people, what do you think about this, this deal that the government is proposing? I'm not getting too much feedback that's saying it's positive. You know, I think the, the opposition has mentioned a number of times, whose side are you on here? Are you on with Islanders or are you not? Like I say, I've always said to people, I support the, cli the climate change and the levies that we're putting in place. But $140 doesn't do anything for anybody. It doesn't help people invest in the things that they might want to do. You know, I, I, I've said to many people, have you gotten a free heat pump? Well, there are people that have gotten them. And I think that's a good investment by government. I appreciate the Premier made an elegant statement about his parents and how they might not have chose the heat pump. That's a good investment. I'll take that. Uh, but the reality is that the, the price points are so low on a free heat pump for most people that very few people are getting them. Then we add in the whole equation about people impact who pay rent. They aren't getting them. That's not so. So once again, we're picking and choosing maybe what would be deemed to be politically popular, say we've got a free heat pump program. But then when we start to dig into the, the whole issue around a free heat pump, we're not seeing that it's a not so free heat pump. Not many people are eligible for the free heat pump. And then when we get into the equation of what do you do with that free heat pump? Most people that have limited incomes, they run into issue. They don't have the electrical capacity to put the heat pump in. Now all of a sudden they have to do an upgrade in their whole property to get the heat pump installed because they probably have a 60 amp service, Mr. Speaker. You're most likely going to need a 200 amp service to put a heat pump in and maybe down the road you might need an electrical charging station and, you know, an electric hot water heater, that comes into the equation too. Can't get that. So now all of a sudden, that's not working out so good for some people. I would have, and then to top it all off, the, the, the minister and the government, they made some announcement that there's only three companies that could actually install the free heat pump. Then I find out it takes six months to get a free heat pump. So people that are getting a heat pump now, or filling out the applications, aren't going to get the heat pump. It'll be winter next time. So these are the things that, you know, we have to think out a little bit when it comes to how we're dealing with our Climate Change Leadership Act, 
how we're putting in, in the carbon levy in place here and seeing how it's going to, to break down, Mr. Speaker. So I go back to saying it's a bad deal we got. We're not helping Islanders nearly enough. We can use arguments that, you know, the free heat pump, that could be a program on its own. Why are we taking our money out of this and putting it into free heat pumps? The Tooney Transit, same thing. If it's a great plan, do that on its own. Give Islanders some opportunity to invest in making their climate change uh, carbon footprint less, Mr. Speaker. You know, I thought same thing with the bicycles. It's one thing to say that we're going to give some money for a bike. I have to admit I'm a bit outdated when it comes to a bicycle, but I took a look at a uh, flyer here the other day to what a bicycle costs. They're expensive. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so if we're giving $100, $150 back on a bicycle, as that's part of where this, um, this money's going, uh, once again, not a lot of people can take a bicycle and go too far with that. And uh, once again, not a bad idea, but that's a good idea to put that on its own, Mr. Speaker. I akin this, it's a case where the Premier, he goes to Ottawa, it's like Jack and the Beanstalk. He goes to Ottawa, comes back, tucks the family cow up to Ottawa to sell it, and he comes back with magic beans. <laughs> 140 bucks and a few trinkets, I just I feel we didn't get a good deal. We didn't get a good deal. Then I, and I get the political strategy to this. The political strategy is probably, oh, it's Justin Trudeau's carbon tax, but we're giving you out all the, all the freebies, all the goodies. Easy to, easy to come across in that capacity, Mr. Speaker. But as I read here, it's a government bill, an act to amend the Climate Change Leadership Act. This is a provincial bill to allow the province to put on a carbon levy. So the political strategy might be around trying to see what you can do to blame the federal government for doing this. And lots of the people will tell me that when I hit, talk to them about it. But I said, it's funny that we're debating the bill here and putting how many four cents a litre onto a a leader of gasoline, Mr. Speaker. So I think it's important that, uh, you know, uh, we at least debate the issue. I'm really confident and hope to hear and take the criticisms that I was part of the debate on a previous uh, climate change bill. And I hope everybody weighs in on this, Mr. Speaker. You know, so I think that's, that's a key component that I want to raise on this issue. And then I get into some other issues when it talks to how much this is going to cost. You know, we already are seeing significant in, in, uh, inputs into uh, cost of transportation, Mr. Speaker, just for going to work and personal transportation. And unfortunately, we just don't have the infrastructure in place to say to people, is the Tooney, the Tooney Transit the way to go? Is that helping a lot of islanders right quickly? It may over time. I hope it does. I hope lots of people use it. But I kind of question whether it's going to be conducive to those people who have to go to work every day in rural communities like, uh, like mine, you know, representing O'Leary Inverness, which is areas West Point, you know, where the, the Tooney Transit may show up, uh, you know, once a day. Well, that's not going to necessarily solve a lot of problems for people or, you know, the hours have to be conducive to how we work. That's a fundamental shift in how we're going to deal with everything we do uh, in working, Mr. Speaker. We get into the cost of agriculture, and, and I know we have, you know, mark fuel that we can burn in our tractors uh, for those that are, that are eligible for it, Mr. Speaker. But, you know, we had a good debate here, and I've been advocating for my own government at the time and, and this government, and they have made some changes to allow produce to go uh, to, into storage from your potato field on mark fuel, and that's a good thing. But the whole premise on what I was trying to accomplish and trying to advocate was to take it to you where it gets processed, Mr. Speaker. So if you're down in Baltic and you're trying to haul potatoes to, uh, to Cavendish Farms, no, that, there's no more, you have to pay for the tax and the fuel at that time. So the carbon levy will come into play on that situation, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would hope government will continue to try to work towards that. But, if, you know, once again, I can take potatoes to my warehouse, where I fuel, but I can't take them to the processing plant. Does that make any sense? It does not, Mr. Speaker. You know, we, we talk about businesses. I got a business in my district out in West Point that has to run generators, Mr. Speaker, because we don't have the infrastructure for three-phase power in the West Point area. Is that, can, can we use marked fuel in a generator for a, a business that manufactures? I look into it, see the tax commissioner here, I don't think we can. <laughs> So these are the types of things that are, that are having impacts here, Mr. Speaker. More. You know, so, so that's the type of stuff that I sort of see when I look at some of these types of issues that we're dealing with, Mr. Speaker. 
Unfortunately, for a company in West Point to manufacture uh, equipment for fire machinery, to manufacture whatever product they're trying to make, they have to run a generator to raise their power requirements, Mr. Speaker, and they, they have to pay a carbon levy on that, Mr. Speaker. And not only that, but they're going to be paying a tax on the carbon levy because 10% of that tax, or 15% of the HST, goes on uh, the uh, overall cost of the fuel, Mr. Speaker. So I think these are the types of things that we need to think about. I got another uh, location in my district, uh, largest sawmill in Prince Edward Island, Mr. Speaker. That's a sawmill. Same thing. Have to run a generator. Have to run a generator to get the electrical requirements. These are the things that I've raised these issues in the legislature numerous times that we don't have the electrical infrastructure and all across Prince Edward Island to handle this. That's where I'd like to see money go. It should be going into that, not from the carbon levy, but the government needs to be invested into that, Mr. Speaker. You know, these are, that's the direction I sort of see. You know, and, and like I say, we can talk all about the prices of fuel, whether it's 4.4 cents a litre. The reality is gas has, gasoline and diesel has gone up significantly. It's going to have every impact on every islander, and it's going to drive inflation, and we're going to add more to that, Mr. Speaker. So, you know, it's making sure that we've got a deal that comes back that makes sure that we're putting our money and the priorities in the right places. That's where, the, that's where I sort of see in all of this, Mr. Speaker. The fact that we have the highest inflation rate probably in North America, I don't know, maybe even higher than that, <laughs> but we can say that we've got some pretty good evidence on the North America side of things, this is going to have a big impact on Islanders. And $140 back is not going to help those Islanders invest in reducing their carbon footprint, Mr. Speaker. I think of uh, the choices that people are going to make, you know, around uh, food pricing, we're going to all be impacted from that. Uh, you know, we, we are going to see significant impacts that are going to translate down on this and that's going to impact inflation, Mr. Speaker. And government has to make the right choices. It's all well and good when we get into economics on inflation. And I always sort of say there isn't a lot you can do about energy prices and there isn't a lot you can necessarily do about food prices. Those prices are usually based on speculation, uh, world and global impacts. But government can be fiscally responsible in the money it spends so it doesn't put an overriding burden on the taxpayer in eating that debt for a period of time, because we can eat debt for a little while, we can only eat for so long. Bond raiders will come knocking on the door. I've seen that, door, that, that scenario before, Mr. Speaker, the old bond raiders. <laughs> three or four of them show up, <laughs> and uh, they start to look, gee, those finances don't look real good. We're going to have to up your, uh, or downgrade your rating. Now all of a sudden there's another quarter percent goes on your interest rates and we've seen the budget pass here recently, what kind of numbers we see in interest rates, Mr. Speaker. So government has to be responsible on how it takes from, from the, our population and, and rewards people back to do the right incentives, Mr. P Speaker. And uh, you know, we also got things that are coming up here, Mr. Speaker. You know, our electric rates are going to probably change in the respect that we're taking away the second block as being eliminated, Mr. Speaker. I have concerns of how, what impacts that's going to have on our agricultural community. You know, uh, so when I look at the type of backstop, if the options were to go to the federal, you'd at least get probably $750 or $1,000 back versus 140 It's just, so when I ask constituents, would you rather $140 and a toonie and, uh, for your trip and a free heat pump? Well, I'm not eligible for any of them, the, most of them would say, or none of that works for me. I think they'd all take the bigger number and spend the money as they uh, deem necessary to try to invest in the things that uh, make some sense, Mr. Speaker. So I really feel that, you know, uh, when we get into trying to figure this out, and I'm trying to figure it out in my own household, Mr. Speaker. I did make some decisions to get rid of my oil tank in my house, went to electric hot water heater, and I, I went to a wood furnace, and uh, I went to some heat pumps. That has reduced my carbon uh, footprint, and you know, I think there are incentives to do that. But you know, if I, I'm very fortunate, and most of us in here would be, that I could justify upgrading, I'd upgrade my electrical system to do that, and like I say, all that stuff wasn't cheap, but I think I'm in a good spot. Now I'm trying to figure out, and had a good conversation with Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, 
how do I figure my transportation issues out, Mr. Speaker? That's where my big carbon footprint comes into play. Because like I said before, it's now cost me about $70 a trip to Charlottetown and back. <laughs> yeah, I know. She's good. Well, and actually, she said she's going to enlighten me a little bit more on that. And I'm, I'm all ears in trying to figure out how we can figure out how to use, reduce my carbon footprint. But not only that, to try to save me money. But I need the right incentives to do that. And we also need an infrastructure that allows Islanders to contribute to that. I've made the statement, I've asked questions here in the House before about our electrical infrastructure. I said, if every house in the Murray Road had heat pumps and an electric vehicle, do we have the electrical capacity to handle that? Mostly the answer is no. <laughs> now, I'm in a pretty typical spot uh, for Prince Edward Island, as the saying goes, as far as rural goes. And, uh, you know, I don't see a lot happening that's going to upgrade that electrical infrastructure. You know, if I take, like I said, my district is probably you know, uh, at least half it might have access to proper uh, uh, electrical capacities, but the other half doesn't. And I bet you if you went all across PI, it's probably a similar number, Mr. Speaker, other than some of our bigger centers, maybe, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. But, you know, so that's where these things need to be thought out a little bit more. And then I look at if I was to buy an electric vehicle, when I talked to the Town of Sherbrooke a bit more, it is a lot about the range of the vehicle is an important uh, component of this. And, uh, you know, I started looking, there are some relatively reasonable priced electric vehicles, but the range is the big factor. And obviously, for, <laughs> I've mentioned many times, the distance uh, from uh, Cape Wolf to uh, Charlottetown, or from Milo to Charlottetown, or Derby to Charlottetown, I need at least a 300 kilometer range. If somebody's going to represent the ride in the Fulary Inverness, they need 300 kilometers. I, anything I looked at, Mr. Speaker, you're probably looking at about $90,000, Mr. Speaker, that uh, it would take to uh, find a vehicle like that, you know? So, uh, so that's, that's a big uh, expense, Mr. Speaker, for a capital improvement. Plus, if I'm looking at having to charge this up at night, you know, that's the only time you're going to get the chance to charge them up, then I've got to put more infrastructure in place. Probably would have to create, uh, you know, get the right charging stations that has the capacity to charge up in a period of time. So, so there are a lot of issues that have to be addressed, Mr. Speaker, and I think urge government to work on those types of issues, give Islanders back some money, get a good deal that uh, Islanders can feel good about, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, you know, then we may be able to start to uh, talk about, you know, what's the, the right thing to do here, Mr. Speaker. Like I say, it's, it's easy to criticize that we gave driver's licenses, uh, free driver's licenses back, but I say, they're not even, they're given the same amount of money back, it's just that it, it, people who don't drive might be getting the money back. So, at least we want to make this, uh, you know, at least fair to those that are paying that get some back, Mr. Speaker. So, so you know, I, I just feel that, uh, We've got a bad deal here, Mr. Speaker. I find it hard to support a deal that uh, isn't uh, superior for Islanders. Uh, you know, I certainly, when I look at our neighbors, New Brunswick, they're getting more money back. We aren't. And, uh, you know, we need to be able to, Islanders need to be able to get some money back so they can reinvest in themselves to reduce their carbon footprint and uh, let's uh, try to work towards that. So, so that's what my points uh, opinions are, Mr. Speaker. So once again, we'll see how this bill, if it gets on the floor in the Committee of the Whole, we'll certainly have lots of questions that we can ask to maybe get more clarification. But uh, in uh, this particular case, uh, before it gets to a Committee of the Whole, we're having the opportunity to debate it. I really would like to hear some more members, uh, their points of view, and I'd like to challenge my point of view, and I'll take my, my uh, hits uh, on this, Mr. Speaker, the way we did it before. But, uh, you know, I just think that's what we're all here as elected representatives. I want to hear from other people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, Third Party House Leader. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise to this important bill and to, to talk a little bit about it. And I think this is really about choices, timing, and we're all under, I mean, the government's under a lot of pressure to do something here, but so is the environment. We have to do more for the environment, and this really comes down to the deal that's in front of us and where Islanders are in the course of history. I mean, record inflation rates, uh, prices at, at the gas pumps are incredibly high. You look at that, isn't that a carbon tax in itself? The amount of, it's jumped. 
people can't afford the way of the way they're living right now and we have to be there for them if this is going to go on you need a better deal to put money back in the islanders pockets because they will make those decisions to choose the environment they will make those decisions and they will try but the problem is the options just aren't there you know when you look at you look at uh, the, how this would affect gas at the pumps, uh, an extra 4.5 cents per liter. Um, add in the HST, that's over 5 cents on top of where we are now. That means today the gas price will be over $1.90. Islanders, Islanders aren't ready for that. They want to, they want to participate. They don't want to. I watched somebody at the, I watched somebody at the, the gas station fill up with $15 in gas. And his just his body language was saying something. They, he, he did. He, he just had to do enough to to get through the day. Diesel's going up over five cents. <coughs> Adding the HST around that at six cents. But the plan, the plan, and what what we've got in front of us is not the best one. And I would agree that Islanders need more money back in their pockets. And the difference is I would agree that somewhere I think that you have to take the responsibility to do those programs for sure. I don't know if a complete federal backstop is there, but I think somewhere in the middle where Islanders get more money, maybe something with a five in the front of it. Islanders need that money back in their pockets. And we and I will look at saying to the government, hey, take a little bit and put it in your programs. Other than that, sharpen your pencils and figure out where you're going to get that money from to make sure Islanders are going to get the money back. You look at your programs that you're running, the electric vehicle rebate, $2.6 million. Look at what you, how much money you were giving out in the past. And when we have this on the floor of the legislature, it's not $2.6 million. There's administration fees in there. Are we really going to provide 500 electric vehicles right now to Islanders? I would love to. I think it's a great idea. They're not there. It says $2.6 million in here. Take that money and give it back to Islanders. Same thing with the, with the bicycle rebates. It said $500,000 for a bicycle rebate. Well, we found out on the floor of the legislature, it's only $350,000. That's $150,000 there that can go back to Islanders. So sharpen your pencils, do things a little bit more efficiently, and make sure this money goes back to Islanders. You look at social development and housing, just for an example. They underspent with money going to their clients, take the money and give it to NGOs. That's millions of dollars right there that should have gone to clients. Sharpen your pencils, do better. This is about the deal. This is about what we're facing with. We all need to get there together collectively. But what we're in front of is, and make it clear that this is a deal, this is a deal that doesn't put enough money. It gives maybe a, uh, some, a family a night out at the movies and a trip to McDonald's for dinner. That's about as much as $150 goes for now. We have to do better. Islanders will do better if you provide them the opportunity. So it's, it's little things like that with it that you talk, about, you talk about the past and you talk about what you're faced with and where we're going and what it's going to be like next year. That's something that we're not talking about, how it, it will become even worse next year for Islanders. And we've got, that gives us a year to put these programs in place to make sure we have EVs, to make sure we have heat pumps. And as the honorable colleague from O'Leary and Verness said, heat pumps, a great idea, it's fantastic, but people in my district, when I knock on their door and I ask them about the carbon tax and I ask them about what would you think about putting in a heat pump and their face drops, they don't, can't even afford the oil bill for that month. They can't get there. We need to support them more. We need to say, hey, you know what? We're going to be there for tenants and work out a deal with tenants and landlords that we can get heat pumps in those facilities, in those places, and make sure that we're working there. We can do better with this. So it's, it's, it's the little things like that, that when you look at your rebates, and I'm just trying to give you ideas. I'm trying to be constructive here because there's, some, there's somewhere in between. We need to give more money out. We need to make sure that we're, 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 we're trusting Islanders with this. Something that we haven't talked about is small business. Small businesses on Prince Edward Island. What's there, what's there for them? Their costs have gone up enormously. You know, you can't get electric equipment to run 
your businesses. Costs are going up. The government costs are going up to build facilities. A lot of it has to do, and there's, there's no support there with them. They employ thousands upon thousands of islanders. We've got to make sure that, that we talk about those and make sure our small businesses are strong so that the, the construction companies, so that the people out there working don't face, don't face this head on. And we talk about, we often talk about mental health and wellness, mental health concerns. This is something that we have to work on right now so that we're there for them. You look at, you look at what we're doing and, and, and the, where $150 will go to Islanders, and I think that you can do better. I think it's a very conservative number, and I think that you can do better. You need to get that up. This is a lot of money that the, the, the revenues that the government are going to be taking in, and it's your decision. I, I, I didn't know about this, so I went around to my district, and I knocked on people's doors, and I just flat out asked them. I was like, what is it that you want me to talk about in here about carbon? And we are talking about this, and it's very complicated, but they, once we started to talk and open that up, it wasn't long before every single one of them said, I don't have the money. I don't have it. I want to participate. I want to help out. I'll adjourn. Honorable members, the Irish is the call. Second. Uh, I'll adjourn the debate. Uh, uh, seconded by the leader of the third party. Shirley Carey. The honorable member from Monocle Kilmuir in the government whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move seconded by the member from Charlottetown Winslow that this house adjourn until Thursday, May the 5th at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Shirley Carey. Carey.